Alrighty, another day and a new story. Yeah, new one. This one's going to be a 15-parter, so either short or long. Nice, nice length there. We'll see how it goes. And remember the YouTube shite and the uh, pinned comment and, and all that stuff. A Brood of Two, written by Faulty Logic Engine. It had been two days already. It should have felt good. He should have felt a sense of triumph, like he had felt after a dozen other battles. His sensory spines drooped low as a sickly feeling sunk deep into his stomach once more. He didn't like remembering that he was alone. The assault was a success. The Yelines had fled the single port city on the planet of Yellow Red. At least, what was left of the city. No more would they harvest minerals from their world with their pitiful slaves. Those blue bloods could take that disgusting practice with them as they gave up on profiting from this world. The Jaxian warrior glanced around at his surroundings. Shattered concrete littered the battle-damaged streets. Smoke and the odd whiff of burned flesh still hung in the air. From his battle swarms fusion rifles, no doubt. He took a few moments to steady himself. He extended four chitinous legs in the approximation of a stretch. His three sets of beady red eyes could almost see into the ruins of the second-story window. His thin abdomen pulsing as he breathed in the hot desert air. Relaxing, the Jax lowered his massive mandibles to pick up the communicator he'd left on the floor. Losing one of his two serrated forelimbs didn't make scavenging easy. His remaining forelimb was already preoccupied lugging around his water supplies. It didn't help that his thorax mounted carrier pack was completely filled with rations and ammo for the fusion rifle that he had slung around his neck. He hardly knew why he kept the communicator anymore. The chatter over the comnet told him that his brood nest had been glassed from orbit. The remaining Chaxians had evacuated from the planet on the last FTL-capable shuttles that they had. He hoped that they were okay. He couldn't bear losing his entire brood, too. Two. The entire task force was dead. His clack was gone. He was alone. Shaking his head, the Jax continued to stalk through the battered streets. He ducked into the shadows cast by the broken buildings to shield him from the blazing heat of the sun. This proved to be harder than he would have liked, seeing as he was himself nearly twice as wide and as long as many of the smaller Yilin transports abandoned along the road. He tried not to think about his missing Clack brothers. The Clack is just silent, he blatantly lied to himself. We are in enemy territory. We couldn't afford to be detected now. Not that there are any enemies around anyway. Smelling the faint scent of recognition pheromones, he started to turn to look down the street to his left. Dark green metal baked in the afternoon sun. The proud insectoid form of a battlesuit lay in the ruins of a storefront. The Jaxian noted the characteristic shape of the Argon plasma blasts around the hole in its thorax section. The likely cause of his demise. Thank you for your service to your queen and the Commonwealth, he whispered under his breath. No one replied. He remembered his clack was no longer here. He was alone. The thoughts were more intrusive now. He was one of many, a collective of minds shared around a number of bodies, one clack. He grew up with his thirty-four clack brothers. From a squirming broodlings, only able to demand food to be grown, trained warriors ready to defend their brood from invaders, they fed as one, they thought as one, they fought as one, they were the clack rust talon. They were each only supposed to become clacks of one after many long years of life. Years that they would spend together. Now, now he was alone. All but one Chax of the Clack Rust Talon had perished in battle, the sands of the desert world thirstily lapping at their spilt blood. Yet, more losses to this pointless war. Why couldn't they just talk, he thought. All twenty-five different sentient species we had met barely even attempted to translate our language. When we bridged the gap in communications ourselves, they still rejected us. We were horrid monsters to them, 
Monsters, though good, occupy territory rich in valuable minerals. Monsters worth slaughtering, like pests. Gee's spitefulness welled up. He would kill those hind legs that threatened his brood. My brood, he recalled. I, um, don't have a brood. I'm alone. Snap. The lone jack sprinched. His head shot up straight in the air, the bristles on his thorax similarly standing on end to listen to the sound. I'm hallucinating, he thought. The isolation must be getting to me. May I, the Emperor, select I'm going mad? He decided to keep moving. There was no chance a broodling was living in the ruins of the city, let alone calling for sustenance. Snap! The jacks continued onwards. His sensory bristles still stood on end. Snap! He stomped. East, around two blocks down and a half a block across. He dropped the water canister and used his four limb claws to preen his sensory bristles. I should keep moving, it's not real. Snap! The jacks picked up the canister and sharply walked towards the source of the sound. Four powerful legs driving him down the street. Dumbly buildings and reiterated Yili mercenaries passed him by as he moved. His sense of reasoning abandoned to satiate his instincts. Snap! The jacks arrived at the source of the sound. There were no Jacksian recognition pheromones in the air, but it didn't cross the warrior's mind in the rush to assist the hungry broodling. He faced the remains of a communication center. Its entrance was buried by the heavy plating for its emergency shutters. A cursory glance of the structure would have revealed that the locking mechanism for the shutters had been melted close by a stray plasma bolt. The jacks had not cared to observe the building and notice the damage. Neither had he noticed a number of cameras that had traced his movements through the ruins of the city over the past few days. With a mighty thrust of his remaining clawed forelimb, he punched through the shutter like old drywall, biting and opening with his mandibles. He wrenched the obstacle free with a squeal and several sonorous clangs of the locks broke one by one. He cast it to the side. Frantically looking into the building, he froze like a fox staring into a rabbit hole. Looking back into his eyes was a thin form of a tan-skinned biped of a species that he had never seen. A depowered slave collar still tightly bound to her neck. He noted the relief in her two hazel eyes and the scent of endorphins radiating out of her. Why was it not afraid? She lazily tapped on the omnipad held loosely in their hand. A speaker next to them came to life. A loud snap of a broodling's mandibles erupted from the device. The Chucks wrestled with their own mind. This was just another enemy of the Commonwealth, he reasoned. Another one of those hind legs trying to kill us. I have no need to help her. She tapped the Omnipad again. Snap. His legs twitched as he smelt her breaths. She was dehydrated. He could tell easily with the low moisture content of her exhaled breath. The relief in her eyes shifted to worry. Aggressively, the woman struck the Omnipad once more. Snap. Now he smelt the adrenaline. She was angry, frustrated. The chacks chittered an alien chuckle. She was no hungry broodling, but was sure acted like one. Slowly, he grabbed his water canister and brought it up to the woman, placing it on the floor in front of her. He slowly unscrewed the valve and opened the enormous canister as large as the woman in front of him. The woman moved quickly. She dropped the omnipad and stumbled across the tiled floor. Cupping her hands together, she heartily drew gulps of water to her mouth. For some reason, the warrior felt an odd sense of satisfaction come over him. Perhaps it was his hormones influencing him. Maybe it was more primal part of his brain rewarding him for caring for others. He didn't try to overcome these instincts regardless. The woman stopped drinking. Her breaths were fast and heavy. She clearly didn't pace herself, the jacks mused to himself. Picking up her omnipad off the floor, the woman tapped on it a few times. The speaker submitted a series of short jitters. Sorry for deceiving you. I didn't know how else to get your attention. Thank you for the water, she said through the device. He could smell her joy as much as see it. It is my pleasure, the soldier jittered back. He watched her listen to a series of translated vocalizations come from the machine. She smiled at him. The Chucks was almost in disbelief. 
Never before had any other species conversed peacefully with his kind, let alone thanked him. It almost felt like he was helping one of his brood. Maybe I'm too badly starved for company if I'm thinking that. His line of thought was interrupted when the woman spoke again. I am Samantha, a human citizen from the Soda Confederation. The data logs of these Lee feckers kept in here says that you guys call yourself the Jacks. What is your name? The Jacks pondered for a moment. Did he have a name? His clack was the rusted talon, but he did not have a clack anymore. Was he still allowed to uphold the name of the group when there was only a single individual in it? I don't have a name. The human raised an eyebrow in response. Well, I have to call you something. How's, um... She inputted a few strings of information into her omnipad. One who has a tendency to bite. She looked up at Chax with a wolfish grin. One who has a tendency to bite. The human listened to the playback of his voice from the device. Hurriedly, she inputted more data into her omnipad and spoke into the device again. That was a translation error. Um, how's bitey for a name? The Jacks recoiled at the suggestion. First peaceful contact with other sentient species, and he's given a bad nickname. The arrogance of this human, acting like she was a doting queen of his brood. Bitey is a terrible name, he deadpanned back to Samantha. Bitey it is. Bitey sat down in front of the building. Finally, feeling at ease, if a little irritated for the first time in what felt like forever. Fine, I'm bitey, the chuck sighed. He didn't really care what he was being called. He was happy. They didn't feel alone anymore. End of chapter. A Brood of Two, Chapter Two, Once Bitten, Twice Shy, written by Faulty Logic Engine. The sun was rising on the fourth day. Bitey had been dreading it. It was a mistake to save the human. The questions, the constant questions. If he wanted to help people learn, he would have been a born a worker, and his clack would have self-assigned themselves a teaching job. Bitey sighed. At least, it was better than the teasing. No, we don't all share one mind. Only the members of a clack do. Even then, it's only pheromones, specific chitters, and intuition. He looked down at the relatively diminutive human. Samantha leisurely strolled out of the front doorway of the building with the speaker strapped to her back. She pulled with one of the earpieces and the headset that she was wearing as it translated Bitey's chitters. And we don't simp for our queens, whatever that is. He struggled to pronounce the sounds of the distinctly mammalian word between his more natural insectoid chittering. The Jacks delicately clambered out of the house through the presently absent second floor, his footfalls landing with faintly echoing clacks as his chitin met the tarmac. Regardless, we think you are avoiding our question, Samantha, accused Bitey. His six translucent eyelids closed slightly to approximate a wince as he stared down at her. The human looked away as if not to meet the gaze of the alien. I uh, don't know what you mean, she replied coyly, with the barely concealed sarcasm. I am merely an aspiring xenoanthropologist asking some questions about alien culture, she proclaimed whilst beginning to walk down the broken street. Bitey was about to call her out in the statement before his thoughts stumbled on a particular word in that sentence. Aspiring? Are you some kind of student? The Jacks watched with surprised delight as the human flinched slightly. He'd been waiting for something to use against her constant teasing. It would explain why you keep acting like a spoiled nestling. Bitey jeered as the massive strides carried him to a moving human. Sam groaned at the insinuation. You sound like my dad, she scowled. I am 18 years old, not 8. I am an adult in every regard. She pointed aggressively at the massive alien towering over her. Bitey recoiled away from the thrust board hand. Huh? I won't have you trying to pull seniority on me too. Bitey could smell equal amounts of amusement and irritation coming from her. It was merely a joke. We didn't mean to assert anything, he showed her. Bitey decided not to bring up the matter of age again, ostensibly to prevent future outbursts from Sam. Thankfully. It was because he knew her teasing would only increase if she found out that he was only half her age. Relaxing his posture, 
He stopped walking and stared directly into Sam's eyes. Back to the topic at hand. Samantha, he began, his translated voice coming through calm and stern through the headset. How much of our water did you drink last night? She scratched the back of her head sheepishly. I don't know, uh, about a liter or so. The same amount of water that would have easily lasted Bitey nearly a week. But she would need it every eight hours. Before they even met, it was already half empty. Do you need it? Bitey queried. We can't sustain the rate of consumption for more than a week. Sorry, um, I'm not adapted for desert environments, even if we are in a city. But it's fine, I know where to get more. Bitey looked at her with suspicion before he spoke. Water is imported on starships. My nest aquifers are most likely vaporized, and we don't think that there will be much water left in the Yelene survival suits. We understand that they are our rather hardy aquatic species, but currently any suits around are probably a uh, little... Uh, he trailed off whilst looking at the mangled and desiccated corpses of several lean mercenaries strewn about at the storefront across from the pair. Ew, Bitey, no. We just need to find one of their aquatic habitation tanks. Bitey focused his gaze back on the human and tilted his head in confusion. I overheard it from one of my captors. He said there's a bunch on a 100th by 57th block. Thankfully, the comm station computer had a map of the city. She chapped on her now wrist-mounted omnipad. It said that it's about a few miles north. The Jacks stared blankly at her as she started hiking up the small sand dune that had built up on the street. They don't just live in the suits, he muttered to himself. I heard that, Sam said smugly, tapping her headset to indicate it picked up his low-pitched chittering. I'm surprised you didn't know. Maybe you need to go back to school. Bitey clacked his mandibles in annoyance. Each member of the clack doesn't know everything. He retorted in his mind. He knew we just needed to communicate. His thoughts trailed on. There wasn't a clack to communicate with. The sinking feeling came back. You okay there, Bitey? He could smell a hint of alarm coming off the human companion. You're looking a little distant. We can stop for a second if you want. The Jaxian snapped out of his stupor and translated voice vibrated through sensory spines. The horrid feeling subsided after a few moments. We, uh... I am fine, he finally responded. As he started following the human, the scent of distress pheromones in the air subsided. The complex was gargantuan. City block after city block of two-story reflective chrome cubes stacked eight stories high. An endless mess of connecting tubes, airlocks, and suit dressing stations. The delicate and carefully considered craftsmanship of the architecture stood in stark contrast to the brutalist and purely functional concrete buildings that made up most of the ruined city, though it hadn't saved it from the devastation of the Chaxis assault. Numerous sections had been blown open by explosives, or else had weeping holes carved in by heat of concentrated plasma streams. Cascading detonations of ruptured generator stations had, had caused the collapse of nearly half of the habitation chambers into shattered piles of scrap metal. The disproportionately large and deliberate nature of the damage indicated that the Chax Star Squalls had definitely known about its purpose, even if Bitey had forgotten. The two travelers progressed into the ruins, despite what remained of the main corridors only being slightly larger than the enormous Chax Warrior. Bitey comfortably scuttled along their length as if they were the tunnels of his old nest. Weak strips of sunlight dimly lit the seemingly endless walkways filtered through cracks in windows or broken ceilings. The pair's fleet clicked as the hardened plastic or chitin met the rough ceramic floor. Mighty hated the faint smell of burned metal that seemed to exude from everything the Yuli made. Yet another reason to dislike those repulsive creatures. Habitation chamber after habitation chamber displayed the same red symbol above the airlocks. Critical leak after critical leak. The remnants of any water being contaminated by fluids from broken coolant lines or else swimming with toxic algae as they multiplied in the stagnant sunlit puddles. Eventually, their wandering led them to the center point of the complex. A gargantuan circular chamber 200 meters wide with walls made of glimmering purple-blue alloy, supporting beams carved organically upwards from the marble floor. 
The center was dominated by a circular arrangement of habitat chambers linked by airlocks and equipment storage rooms 150 meters across. Each was labeled clearly in galactic basic. Dazzling sunlight flooded the chamber from the cavernous opening in the ceiling. Bullet-ridden Chuck's corpses lay broken amongst the rubble that had fallen in with them. Mighty couldn't identify the clack the warriors belonged to. The characteristic faint orange stripe that ran from the top of their thorax down to the abdomen, however, marked them as part of the amber brood. A marking he too possessed. And there it is, exclaimed Samantha triumphantly. Mighty traced her gaze to the one cube at the far side of the room, facing slightly away from her. He had to strain his eyes to see the sliver of a green light coming off the side above the door. Go fetch us some water, and I'll go rummage around these storage rooms for anything useful. Mighty nodded in agreement. It was odd that she was the one giving orders, but they were reasonable. There was little point disagreeing just to establish authority. His long legs carried him across to the aquatic habitation chamber in short order. He observed the door for a moment to decide his next move. Grassing with the airlock too much will only cause us to lose much more of the water source, he reasoned. He looked around for a better entry point. A ladder, about the right dimensions for a human-sized being, led all the way up to the top face. A maintenance hatch, perhaps? Sheer metal and two stories tall. A ladder too small for him, so climbing was off limits. Mighty narrowed his eyes as he determined the exact height of the cube. He was stubborn. He had agreed to the plan. He would see it through alone. The human shouldn't do everything for him. With his one four-clawed forelimb, he took off his fusion rifle and carrier pack. With practice flicks of his claw, he undid the latches on his battle plate one by one. The armor fell to the floor with a thud as the interwoven fibers absorbed the shock of the metal plates. Mighty stretched every weary muscle in his being. A few ligaments in his missing right forelimb also tensed. It had nearly grown up to his elbow. The pale white carapace of the new tissue barely distinguishable from the naturally dark yellow hue. The whole thing would grow back within a month if he fed himself well. Taking deep breaths from his abdomen, he kept his eyes focused on the top edge of the cube. He sunk low to the ground with all four legs. Oxygen-rich blood flowed into his relaxed leg muscles. The muscles tensed. Like a release spring, Bitey shot straight up into the air with a monstrous power. A single leap was just enough. His forward pair of legs shot out in conjunction with his forelimb to latch onto the ledge of the habitation chamber. Almost right in front of his face was the circular shape of an access hatch. With negligent ease, he hoisted himself up and onto the top face. The hatch had a keypad adjacent to it, locking it with several mechanical latches. Bitey wasn't going to bother with the key codes. He tensed a series of muscles in his forearm. A meter-long biometallic talon flicked out from a concealed cavity on the underside of the limb. With a few powerful swipes of the rust-colored blade, each latch was systematically cleaved off. Breaking the talon back into his arm, he reached his clawed hand down to open the comparatively small hatch. The scent of fresh water crashed against his senses. Another ladder descended a few meters down before meeting the waterline. He couldn't see the bottom of the chamber, only the dark blue murk. In a fluid motion, Bitey removed his water canister hanging from his neck and lowered it into the blue pool. Bubbles escaped from the canister as cool water flooded in. Come on, one of you has to be an idiot. Samantha had walked past about a dozen sealed doors already. Each required a keycard. A keycard she rather unfortunately did not possess. In the near distance, she could hear the odd thuds and clangs coming from her big friend. She stopped at the door number 13 and smiled gleefully. A storeroom door with a keycard graciously left at a slot. How thoughtful of them to leave such a wonderful gift. With mocking grace, she opened the metallic door and plucked the card from its slot, squirreling away her veritable skeleton key into a fanny pack. The waft of air seemed warmer than it should have. Weren't these chambers supposed to be cool? She brushed it off. Light fixtures on the ceiling flickered to life. Several alcoves in the wall were occupied by empty Yulene survival suits, and several rifles lined up against the rack on the left wall. Samantha sighed. She hoped to find some kind of food. Not that she needed it. Vitey had hundreds of kilograms of rations in his carrier bag. 
His processed fungus blocks certainly were edible, but they tasted exactly like old shoe leather to her. A week of nothing but that would drive any human to insanity. Sam still couldn't understand how the Chuck scoffed him down so happily. Maybe Bitey would enjoy nibbling on my dad's old hiking boots, she giggled to herself. She had one last look around the room before she prepared to leave. It was then that she noticed the shine. Her eyes snapped to the matte gray floor. She had missed it on her first sweep of the room. There was a puddle. Then there another. And another. They were small but numerous. The kinds of water splattering that she would make coming out of a shower. She traced her eyes upwards to the alcove behind the splatterings of water. The empty alcove behind the splatterings of water. He was missing a survival suit. Her eyes widened. Crap! was all that escaped her lips before a sound ripped through the massive chamber a moment later. Bang! End of chapter. A Brood of Two, Chapter Three, The Bigger Stick The noon sun pierced through the ceiling of the chamber. Mighty hoisted the refilled water container out of the murk, resealed it, and hung it around his neck. He heard a gentle thunk of a door seal opening and a few habitation blocks to his right. Samantha, most likely. Bitey approached the lip of the chrome metal cube. Did you find anything useful so far? He called out, the clicking sounds he made echoing faintly across the hall. With a small hop, he fell to the floor with a thud, his joints groaning slightly under the force of the landing. A figure twenty-odd meters away looked up at Bitey. Noticing them, Bitey returned the stare and froze. A pair of massive yellow fish-like eyes stared into the chucks through a set of goggles. A massive pink maw crammed with translucent conical teeth gaped open like a vice of a bear trap. The interior and exterior gill surfaces of the creature were capped with artificial domes. Oxygenated water continually supplied to the gills by a series of plastic pipes. The creature's deep black scales, where they were not covered by the aquamarine body glove, glittered in the sunlight. An eel-like tail swayed slightly from behind its vaguely humanoid form. Webbed hands held a black firearm in an increasingly tighter grip. The Yuli and the Jack stared at each other for an eternal second. Chemicals raced through their bloodstreams and electrical signals fired down their nerves, both carrying the instructions that would dictate their very survival. The Yuli moved a half moment faster than Bitey. The gun rose up, and the chucks as he bolted towards the frightened, pristine alien. Bang! The rocket-propelled projectile screeched through the air with deadly force. The aim of the shot was true, and Bitey could only reduce the inflicted damage. Ducking slightly at the last half moment, he let the round impact his upper thorax. The bullet exploded as it entered his carapace. The splintered chitin burned in searing pain as shrapnel lanced into his splash. Bitey sank down on his haunches, anticipating the trajectory of the next bullet. The Lee had done exactly as expected, the second shot twisting through the air above him. Bitey's panic subsided as his muscle memory took over. The Lee were always predictable. They never changed. Bitey's four legs pushed against the floor, propelling him forward to close the final ten meters. The Lee panicked, forfeiting a third shot. They leapt towards the open doorway. Bitey's forelimb shot forward. It concealed talon flicked outwards and extended his reach. The tip lodged itself into the doorframe, the blade's edge pointing outwards to the oncoming Yuli. Bitey's opponent couldn't reduce the momentum in time. Boots scraped ineffectually against the ground until the Yuli was caught in the blade. The creature hissed in pain as the chak's appendage cut through the body glove and a bit into his scales. The blade stopped only skin deep. The Yuli attempted to aim its gun up at Bitey in the last bit to survive. Bitey swiped the blade outwards with a cold precision. Using a newfound force, the blade carved away through scale, flesh, and pale bones with a sickening ease. Two lifeless chunks of meat dropped messily on the floor, impacting with wet slaps. As he turned to observe his surroundings, Bitey heard Samantha cry on pain and dashed away to find her. Samantha sprung out of the storeroom the moment she heard the gunshot ring out, turning towards the origin of the sound. She watched an unarmed Chax disappear around a bend as a second shot rang out. The patting of boots caused her to look over her shoulder in the other direction. Two armed Yuli were storming towards her as their eyes 
met Samantha's, she immediately dove into the storeroom and yanked a gun off the wall. Their jog became a sprint. They were only seconds away. Samantha wrapped her hand around the grip, only to hear a disapproving beep from the weapon. Of course they have genetic locks, feck, she swore under her breath. A gun barrel swept into sight, and she threw herself to the side of the doorway, hoisting up her own rifle by the barrel as if wielding a club. She prepared to strike. As the first Yuleen's gun entered the room, she slammed her own useless firearm into it. The creature's weapon clattered onto the floor, eliciting a frustrated hiss from its owner. With a fluid motion, it dove towards Samantha. In response, she swung her gun, hitting the side of the Yuleen's head with a thwack and shattering one of its goggles. It grimaced, but pushed forward in short order. Now Samantha raised her forearm to block the expected shove. It instead opened its jaw and chomped down on her arm. Warm blood trickled out of the wound as she cried out in pain. Gritting her teeth, she headbutted the Yuli. It loosened its grip on her arm as a concussive force shot through its head. It was then the second Yuli rushed into the room, raising its gun towards the ongoing melee. Samantha needed cover. Thinking quickly, she lifted her right leg and stomped on the first Yuli's knee. It bent backwards with a wet crack. Immediately exploiting the gap in the defense as it wailed in pain, she tore her own free from its mouth and flung her undamaged arm around its neck. In a single motion, she put it into a headlock and turned it to face the second Yuli. With a free hand, she firmly grasped the water supply pipe at the back of its head. The first Yuli squirmed under her lock but failed to free itself. Samantha had her cover. She could just about make out the familiar thudding sound quickly approaching her location. Surrender! Samantha yelled at the Galactic Basic, her speaker emitting a series of chitters as it translated the statement into checks automatically. The second Lili goofed at the demand. Why should I? It replied, its voice raspy and harsh. Because I can kill your friend here, the Lili grinned impishly. He... An inconvenience at best, human. I can do without him. That's rather mean, isn't it? Yeah, you always were a prick, sputtered the grappled Yuli. Shut up, Jask. You know you would do the same. Also, human, get your device to shut up too. It's giving me a headache, the grimmins. It sounds like a fecking Chuck's chatter. Samantha grinned. It is Chuck's chatter. The Yuli looked at her with confusion. Why the fuck would you want to? A claw shot through the doorway and grasped the Yuli's head. It retracted back, yanking the now screaming alien with it out of sight. Jask's face contorted in terror as he heard the screeching of his ally falter into a wet gurgle. Eventually, nothing else could be heard aside from the cracking of bones and the splatter of viscera on the floor. Even Samantha was horrified at the noises coming from just outside the room. Mighty, can you stop doing, uh, whatever it is you're doing? I think I'm gonna throw up. The sounds of butchery quickly ceased. Uh, sorry, I got carried away, Mighty apologized. How the feck do you get a Chax to work with you? The remaining Yili choked, still in a headlock. I asked nicely. Interested in surrendering now? She asked her captive softly. Just stopped struggling entirely. Good, now walk with me. Samantha had half carried Yili out the room, considering that it had only one functioning leg. She was expecting to feel nauseous at the sight of what remained of the other Yili. Sam was pleasantly surprised at the lack of a stench and the fact that everything was saturated in a deep blue blood. It prevented her from being particularly revolted at the mess. Mighty was casually cleaning the blood off his claw with his mouth parts. His massive mandibles were held open to make room for the limb. Mighty, can you hold this one for me? Don't kill him, please. Mighty stopped and looked at the captive. He reached down and took the Jask by the chest. He effortlessly lifted him up off the ground. Jask's legs dangled helplessly under him. Samantha took a moment to breathe. She had never been so close to death before. It was a good thing the Yili got distracted easily, or else she would have had a bullet in her by now. She chuckled slightly. No wonder they use slaves. Their normal workers must suck at their jobs. As the adrenaline faded from the system, she could start feeling the pain in her left arm more acutely. It was only a flesh wound, thankfully, but there were other matters to resolve first. Jask, was your name right? She asked the dangling Yili. Yeah, he responded. Right, Jask, how many more of you are there? 
He smiled wickedly. More than the two of you could handle. It is lying, Bitey said flatly. Both bipeds looked at Bitey. And how are you sure? Samantha asked. I can smell it. You can smell a lie? And most simple emotions. Bitey noticed Samantha's look of contempt. She shook her head. I need some bloody deodorant then, she said, raising her hand to rub her nose. She winced in pain as she used some of her lacerated arm muscles. All right, Bitey, uh, do you have any bandages? Yes, they're in my carrier pack, he replied. Samantha looked up and down, and now more or less naked Chuck's warrior. And, um, where is that? she asked, cocking her head to the side. Bitey turned around and pointed his arm in the direction that he came from. Jask grunted as Bitey's claws dug into his scales slightly with a swing of Bitey's limb. Right, uh, thanks. The two, now three, walked back to collect Bitey's things. Jask kept looking back and forth between the two. What the feck kind of relationship do you have? He spurted. Samantha thought for a moment. Friends, I'd say, she responded with a confident grin. Bitey nodded. He liked the sound of that. Friends feels about right, he agreed. Jask looked at the two again, this time with astonishment. You made friends with a Chax? Are you insane? Samantha shrugged. Maybe you're just insensitive, Bubbles, she chortled to herself. <laughs> Bubbles. End of chapter. A Brood of Two, Chapter Four. Sorry, say that again. Dusk crept into view on the fifth day, at last. If anyone had asked Jask what the worst possible torture he could think of was, it wasn't anything like the events of the past five days. But damn did it feel like it, and sometimes. The local Chax brood broke through the front lines and assaulted the city. That was seven days ago. By the end of the second day of the battle, the entirety of Port Gale had been evacuated, except for the uh, forgotten half of the militiamen. Even the slaves got up before them. Jask would strangle those corporate jerks for that decision if he could. Gale was bombarded from orbit on the third day. The remainder of that day was spent trying not to get disintegrated by Chuck's fusion rifles or stabbed in the back by another bastard scavenger. Not a day later, his captive, his uh, golas, an idiot and a monster, now his being hulled in the destroyed store, struggling to sleep by the Aquahab tank. Those two wouldn't shut up. The universe just loves defecating on his quarrel. Can I get worse than this, he thought. Say ah, Bubbles, Samantha asks, attempting to feed the tied-up Yili with the lecton bar. Jask tried his best to keep his expression neutral. He needed to understand his captors. Any information would help him formulate an escape plan. But to escape, he first needed his leg to heal. Samantha had somehow found a Yelene first aid manual in the Habitation District start terminal. The procedure the human performed to set his luxation had knocked him out. The pain was as intense as the dislocation itself. It was equally as brutal too. At least she made a spin for him, altogether an oddly thoughtful series of gestures. Further evidence that she was completely insane. Jask opened his mouth and took a bite of the soft bar swallowing it immediately. Can I use my hands, please? he asked resentfully. Why? You don't need them, she replied, taking a bite of her own bar. With her mouth full, she laughed. Besides, this is fun. This is demeaning, Jask retorted through his gritted teeth. It's not that. I'm just being nice, right, Bitey? The Jacks had his fusion rifle drawn, his gaze focused on their prisoner like a predator ready to pounce. The leer alone was enough to make Jask's blood run cold. His stare shifted to Samantha. You are treating him like an incapacitated larva, not an injured adult, he replied coldly. I am surprised that I agree with the murder machine over there, Jask said. Although he didn't admit it, Jask appreciated the spare headset gifted to him by the human. It helped reduce the headaches induced by listening to the abomination speak and allowed him to actually understand what it was saying. You guys are no fun, Samantha sighed. She quickly undid the binds around his hands and passed him the remainder of the bar. I'll get used to it. I'm doing those back up again later. Samantha took a few steps back and sat on a supply crate that they had scavenged from the habitation district. Well, that's the next five minutes of entertainment gone. Jask 
briefly considered if he could pick up the Aline firearm Samantha had acquired. Bidey's stuck gaze dissuaded him from even thinking of trying. He'd have to wait for the right opportunity to make his move, whenever that was. Bidey hated having the captive, but Samantha insisted on not murdering prisoners, that uh, she wasn't a killer. Bidey thought otherwise. The Yuli was a liability. Every moment he could smell flushes of fear, frustration, and odd calm coming off the creature in waves. He couldn't read minds, but he was certain he was thinking of ways to escape. Despite his personal grievances, Bidey knew Samantha was right not to kill him. He was a member of the Jack species. He wasn't cruel. Unlike the hind legs, Jack had surrendered and he had an obligation to keep him alive. Should Jask attempt to break free and threaten him or Samantha, however, he would promptly ensure he became very dead, very quickly. Mighty felt confident that Jask knew it too. Can you explain something to me, Bubbles? Samantha asked. Jask finished his meal and nodded. Why does everyone seem to hate the Chaks? I've heard a little from Bighty, but I want some first-hand opinions. Jask looked at her in bewilderment. Her expression and tone conveyed a question as completely serious. It must have been some kind of weird human joke. I don't get the question, he said slowly. I meant exactly what I said. Oh, so she is in fact a complete dumbass. Just look at it. They are ugly as sin, the only sentient insectoid species we have ever met. Their speech gives people headaches, we started. They trigger the fight or flight instincts of almost every species with but a glance. He leaned forward and shook his hand as he enunciated every word. Hyper, expansionist, hyper, aggressive, soulless. Samantha frowned and kicked his good leg as if to tell him off at the last remark. Jask studied the Chax's neutral expression before continuing. You saw what it did to Daleks and Fune yesterday. It didn't even flinch. It just massacred them in an instant. He shuddered at the memory of the sounds of his dying compatriots. We were shooting at each other from day fecking one. Hell, we didn't even know they actually had compatible linguistics until they figured out how to translate galactic basic. By then, we had already snuffed out millions of each other's lives and several colonies. They are little more than animals, human. Even a blind Uber can see that. He stopped to catch his breath. Samantha looked puzzled. Is that it? Jask shook his head. Their rate of evolution is beyond abhorrent, too. So far, we have come across at least seven subspecies, with adaptations to various habitable climates. If something can live somewhere, the Chucks will settle it. They are a scourge! Samantha kept up her apparent confusion. Is that it? Jask threw up his hands, exasperated. Yeah, that's about it. He spat back. Samantha casually took another bite of a necton bar and let out a resigned sigh. She turned back to Bitey with a dissatisfied look. How much of that would you say is true? She asked Bitey. The Chax's sensory spines shivered. His species version of a shrug. I can't say much for how we make the hind legs feel. As for everyone else, he isn't correct. However, I believe describing our nature as aggressive and expansionist is a gross exaggeration. The Yelin has neatly left out my species' attempts at peaceful resolution. Jas scoffed at the claim. As if peace settlement was an option, he retorted, before new territories could be assigned to the appropriate civilization by the United Species Organization. Your kind would easily just have waltzed right in with the perfect subspecies and took it. We'd be back to where we were before the start of the war, but you would have pushed your borders out even further. Mighty glowered at the Jask, annoyance readable on the clack of his mandibles. It was an option. We had population controls on our homeworld and orbital stations for centuries before we developed faster than light travel. We could have drawn part borders and stuck to them eagerly. It's your hind legs masters who are the monsters who refuse peace. They wanted to push us out of our homes and take our lands for mighty operations. Oh crap. It's what your kind was already doing to us. We had to uproot every illegal colony we found before you muscle us off the rightfully assigned worlds. Rightfully assigned? The Amber Brood's Nest has been here on Yellow Red for three decades before your kind found your port city. Bitey snapped back. 
his voice alarmingly loud. You appeared and immediately set about defiling this world with crust-cracking, slave labor, and my brood's slaughter. There is nothing rifle about this. Your brood was a potential military threat to the civilian population of our settlement. They had to go, Jask said with a hiss. A threat to civilians, Bitey roared. The Chax lashed out with his claw, grasping the Jask's neck tightly. Samantha dropped his second boot bar immediately and tried to wedge herself between the two. Mighty, stop. His grip tightened. He was no longer listening. Almost all of the Chaks there were civilians. The 4,000 warrior and worker volunteers that attacked Port Gale were nearly all the military force the brood had left on a planet. Jask scrambled to open Bitey's grasp to no avail. The captive was forced to watch his imminent demise with justified terror. Mighty, don't kill him, Samantha shouted. We're our five million nestlings and workers, military threats, when you immolated them from orbit not even a week ago, Bitey rasped. I have no brood because of your kind. My brothers are dead because of you. I am alone, all because of you. Back, Bitey diverted his glare to Samantha. She held the rifle butt forward ready to strike his arm again. Tears welled up in her eyes. I said, don't fucking kill him. He didn't do crap. The scent of fear and distress was almost palpable. I am making her upset, Bitey realized. With his rage subsiding, he could hear Jask's wheezing breaths, his windpipe and gills thrumming tight between his claws. He relaxed his hole and pulled him slowly closer to his face the last flickers of the fading sunlight illuminating the side of his head with a pink glow. Jask could only stare into the eyes as he drew him in. Something about the Chaks felt different. Jask couldn't understand exactly what. The damn creature didn't have brow ridges or lips or anything to convey emotion. Regardless, he didn't feel scared anymore, like he normally did looking at a Chaks. The only way he could describe the feeling was that it gave off an intense air of melancholy. Enthralled by the concealed suffering behind the alien visage, he averted his eyes. The next translated words chilled him to the bones. I don't care what your kind feels when they look at us. I don't care if you see a person or a monster when you look into my eyes. But consider this, hind leg. Who's more likely to be the monster of the story? The pests or those who deem them so? Mighty, let go of the Yuli. You! Disgust me. Bitey retreated slowly and tucked himself into a corner to lie down and sleep. Samantha, take the first watch, please. I need rest. Samantha released her held breath, rubbing her eyes. She sat down next to the stunned Jask. She used the moment of stupor to tie him down again. But Jacks are, he mumbled weakly. Solus, she echoed his thoughts. It's just as I said, Bubbles. What? He weakly responded, looking at the human. In contrast to Bidey, Jask found the human overly impressive. A multitude of facial muscles contorting her face into a configuration to match any emotion that he could think of. What she currently displayed was disappointment. You're just insensitive, she said. Samantha sat down on a crate before him. She poked on her omnipad in silence. Jask finally had the quiet he desired. But to his own surprise, it left him feeling uneasy. He lay down to catch some sleep. Yet, he couldn't erase the image of the Chax's depressing glare from his mind. He was etched in, like a brand. He had seen that look before. One he's tried hard to forget. End of chapter. Chapter 5. Maybe 3 is still company. What are we going to do now? Jask asked groggily. He blinked a few times, adjusting to the light of the new morning, having only just risen from his sleep. We are going to try and get our butts off this planet, she responded while in the process of untying his bonds. So in other words, we need to get a signal satellite broadcast going. Samantha stood back up and the cords came loose in her hands. She dug them free from his body and gathered them up to be put away in a backpack. Jask rubbed his sore wrists as he stood up for the first time in a number of hours, casting his eyes about the room. 
he noticed Mighty was already awake. As the Chaks finished gathering his things, their eyes met for a moment. It was like staring into the eyes of a lion at rest. A great predator that was calm, but still attentive. It made Jask feel uneasy. Are we hedging our bets on someone passing through the system and hearing a distress beacon? Jask started. He clicked his tongue. You know, that's rather unlikely, right? Better than nothing, Bubbles. That much Jask knew was true. The chances of somehow flagging down a passing starship were better than finding an exceedingly rare FTL-capable shuttle lying around in working condition. Especially considering the circumstances they found themselves in. Why aren't we doing this later tonight when it is not a bazillion degrees? He sighed. I am less active, Mighty answered. If we stumble on more survivors, it is best that I'm in peak physical ability to ensure our safety. Jask let out a disgruntled chuff. Breakfast, offered Samantha, holding out a necton bar. Jask lamely took the food item with an appreciative nod. Where are we going? he asked as he unpeeled the wrapper of his ration. A comms unit, nearest one is five hours away. Five hours? Yay, he replied. Samantha smirked as she made her way to the front entrance to the building. Jask inspected his untied hands. He looked toward Samantha and Bitey, her in turn looking back at him expectantly. Bitey had his fusion rifle in his hand. He wasn't going to be carried like the day prior. Five hours, yay, he groaned. Most buildings were melted or charred husks of what they once were. The odd corpse occupying space here or there. Perhaps a destroyed tank or a chack's battle suit. Those usually came in groups. Ash and sand-strewn roads stretched out as far as the eye could see. Although the latter was slowly drawing out the former. To Samantha, the oppressive heat was just about bearable. Given the shade of the burnt buildings and the wind that ripped through the abandoned streets. A quick peek at Bitey told her precious little... The Jacks continued striding forwards emotionlessly, like he always did. She did feel like she was getting better at reading him, however. Odd jitters or glances at his surroundings told her that he was on edge. Occasional momentary stares at seemingly random objects was a sign that he was contemplating things. She reckoned that he was trying to distract himself from his own thoughts. Whatever they were, they couldn't be anything present. Now Jask, on the other hand, can... Can we stop for a while? The Yili panted. Samantha and Bitey were both pulled from their thoughts at the suggestion. It's only been an hour. Are you really that tired after a short stroll? Samantha queried with a mocking grin. Your, your, yeah, your, your short stroll is, would get me across most of tolls and death. I'm only s semi-aquatic. Jask paused to catch his breath and filter more oxygen through his gills. So, you're not used to walking around on the land for hours at a time? She asked, cocking an eyebrow. Bitey looked down at the human before shaking his head in preemptive disapproval. Yes, Jask said, still out of breath. In other words then, Samantha began, her pitch increasing with barely contained amusement. Please don't, Bitey pleaded softly, eliciting a confused look from Jask. You're saying that you're a fish... Out of water. Both males groaned at the poor joke. Samantha just spoke out in a fit of giggles. You bloody terrestrials are a pain of my existence, grumbled Jask. Seriously, Samantha, I've been around you only a week, and I've already received enough jokes and snide remarks to last me a queen's lifetime. Bitey chastised. If I could not smell your good intentions, I would have assumed that you wanted me to be aggravated enough to kill you. Okay, fine, I'm sorry. Bitey, do you mind carrying him again? The checks sighed. Not enough to say otherwise. I'd prefer to have my hand free this time. I could tie him to your back like a satchel, Samantha suggested. That would work. Jask only whined as Samantha retrieved the spool of rope from her bag. Two more hours passed by until the group decided to take a short break. Rations were quickly doled out, and they sat in the shade of a wrecked tank. Can you let me change one of my water tanks before we continue? Jask asked meekly. Samantha nodded and approached the Yuli. 
What's Dyth? inquired Samantha as she untied Jask for the second time that day. What? he said back, half paying attention. Jask gestured for Bitey to pass over the massive water canister he carried. The Jacks wordlessly picked up the place the cylinder in front of the Yuli. You mentioned it earlier, Samantha continued. Jask reached around to his side and undid a small latch on the small canister adjacent to one of the two larger water tanks. It's the Yuli homeworld, he answered. He calmly twisted the valve, letting out a small steam of murky liquid from the bottom of the smaller canister onto the sand until it ran clean. The most beautiful place in all the galaxy. Blue-gray water world orbiting around a brown dwarf, which itself orbits a main phase star. Sounds pretty. Never been there. Been to Dyth. I'm from Dyth, he boasted, puffing out his chest slightly. Jask deftly unbuckled and twisted close two more valves before unclipping a small canister from his back. You're a homeworlder. Lucky you, Samantha said with a smile. What's it like? Jask stared into the massive Chuck's water tank as he filled his canister, lost in thought. For a place where you can move and build in three dimensions, it is crowded as hell. Habitation complexes as far as you can swim, restaurants, shops, casinos, and fancy crap galore. There are buildings on the surface, a lot of it too. Most of above water stuff is industry as, you know, fire and electricity don't go well with water. He paused again as he retrieved a now filled canister. Deep water tends to be pretty open though, where it isn't netted off to protect the wildlife. A lot more blue, not the polluted crap around the cities. Never got to visit those parts often. Ever feel like going back? Yes, uh, with my head attached, he joked, elbowing the resting bitey just behind him. The jack snapped his mandibles in annoyance at the gesture. Jask's expression fell a little as he next spoke. Uh, probably not for a while, though. At least not without a heap of credits to my name. Some employment officials would try and press gang me into labor false otherwise. Telling me a bunch of tales to get my sympathy. Jas clips the canister back into place with a smirk. Who knows, he responded coyly. I know, he was telling the truth, Bitey flatly chimed in. Jask sharply turned to glare daggers at him, screwing the valve shut. No, I call you bluff, you aren't some kind of living lie detector, said Jask. But, declared Samantha, three truths, two lies, the reward is your pride. Fine, he barked back. Jask stared into Bitey's eyes, watching him slowly cock his insectoid head. I'm 31, I have 23 siblings, I've drunk Magistrate Celis under the table, I have a degree in geology, and there are no slaves on Dyth. Bitey's entire body seemed to fix itself in place. Several series of sensory spines splitted in the wind. Finally, after a few seconds, Bitey craned his head towards Jask. Yes, yes, no, no, yes, he answered. He leaned back into a more natural resting position. Bitey still did not break eye contact. And I sense a bit of rush of frustration, perhaps despair too. Jas grumbled as he re-secured the final latches for the water tank. No slaves on your homeworld, huh? A triumphant Samantha remarked. Why's that? It's a sort of a religious thing. No aliens allowed, and you can't take other Yili as property. So you have to make it up with the uh, lower class menials. He paused for a moment. Wait, why am I answering all of your questions? Where the hell are you from? Samantha clicked her tongue. He finally caught on, she thought. A little old colony on Arcadia, too, was her curt reply. Mighty, the sudden yelp startled the massive chucks. You're from here. Anything special this world be worth mentioning? There is sand. The seas are mostly brine. It is yellow and red. Riveting, said Jask sarcastically. Hold on, don't you call this planet Yellow Red? Samantha queried. Bitey did not respond. He knew where this question was going to lead. It can't be because it looks... Bitey remained silent. Seriously, that is beyond lazy naming. Why didn't you just give it some kind of numerical designation at that point? Did you just give up? She chuckled. Even Jask seemed mildly amused by the notion. If I remember correctly, you have a colony on a heavily forested planet not too far from here. What do you call it? inquired Jask with a wry smile. Bitey looked away from the pair and mumbled something barely audible. Uh, can you repeat that, please? Samantha asked, cupping her hand to around the back of an ear. Its name is Green Four, 
a dejected bitey repeated. The revelation induced a greater fit of laughter from the human and a small chuckle from the Yili. It's not stupid if it works, Mighty grumbled. I have to know what the Chucks named their home world now, Jask demanded. Mighty's demeanor improved as he answered. Our home world is called Venus Sky. The Nixie, meaning the nest of many broods in Old Ruby. Huh. That's a pretty good name, actually, Samantha commented before taking a swig of water from the flask. Jask snorted in surprise. I was expecting a title just as lame, like dirt or something. Samantha nearly choked in the water after hearing that. You good? Ah, uh, <coughs> fine, she coughed. Bitey tilted his head as he looked at Samantha, packing his mandibles a few times. Despite his inhuman nature, Samantha felt that his expression screamed a sense of smugness. Colors are fine, but naming our homeworld something like uh, dirt would be very silly. Definitely, she kept her expression as indifferent as possible. Samantha made a mental note to spray him with a retributory perfume if she got the chance. Him being able to smell emotions was getting annoying. Worse still was that he seemed to be getting better at it. She wondered how he would fare without his little super sense. We've taken long enough break. Let's get going. Bubbles back into the bug. She collected the ropes from the sandy ground. We have a few more hours of walking ahead of us. End of chapter. Chapter 6. A Loud Greeting Early afternoon had rolled around on the sixth day by the time Samantha, Mighty, and Jask reached the comm station, the latter of which was let down from Bitey's back and tied for the third time that day. The familiar but much larger site of the two-story communication station lay before them. A cursory inspection of the metallic grey structure revealed it had been largely unmolested by the prior battle. Its deployed emergency shutters, which covered the entire front of the building, had only minor scorch marks. A portion of the second floor was conspicuously missing, however. It appears it is my turn to open the shutters, Samantha said, walking up to a small terminal on the side of the station. She fished a small card out of a pocket and inserted it into a small slot with a satisfying click. Where in the Tanar did you get a level 3 access card? Jask asked. I found it, she replied, tapping away at the small screen in front of her. Six central latches that anchored the thick purple shutters in place all came undone at once with a sharp clang. The shutters opened horizontally with a grinding creak to reveal the wide doorless entrance. Open sesame. Samantha strutted to the front of the building, neatly tossing and catching the access card as she went. Now step two, we use the bad boy to get into the... Whitey's pines all stood on end. In an instant he lunged forward and shoved the human back as the kinetic round whistled through the air, missing her head by only a few centimeters as the snap of its firing reached them a millisecond later. He sharply turned his head to the aggressor from the inside of the building. Friendly, he declared, his chittering voice booming through the empty streets around them. She's friendly. Samantha picked herself off the floor and approached the entrance once more. Bitey's calm demeanor had completely evaporated. The sensory spines on his body still stood on end. His movements were erratic as he placed about. It reminded her of a dog that was about to be taken out for a walk. Wasting little time. She peeked around the corner to get a view of the building. Crouched down behind the bullet-riddled desk with a shadowy corner of the room was a familiar form of a chax. It was far smaller than Bitey, whereas he stood nearly a story and a half tall. This one only came up to Samantha's chest in her current stance. Samantha ducked back slightly as she saw the rifle held in its talons. Its body was encased in the same dark yellow carapace that the faint sheen on its back belayed its presence of two withered wings. It also lacked the massive cutting mandibles that Bitey had. Damn, two for two, Samantha remarked. You should check up on comm stations more often. Why are you with the hind legs? The small chacks asked. Its voice was soft, quiet, far more so than Samantha was expecting. We're friends, Bitey responded, his massive frame standing just outside the comparatively tiny doorway. That's... Not what I was expecting. They actually talked to you. You aren't captive or anything. We do have a captive, but it's definitely not Bitey. Samantha chimed in. Bitey, who... Uh... The Jacks trailed off as a focus changed to the antsy Jacks warrior outside the building. 
The smaller Jax's posture softened as she let out a small bout of mirthful chittering, which was quickly stifled by a quiet whine of pain. The arm holding the body of the rifle reached back to hold her side. Crap, are you injured? Samantha asked. Bitey immediately scrambled to retrieve his emergency medical supplies from his carrier pack. No, I just get random spikes of pain when I laugh. Their last few words were almost growled at Samantha. A two-meter-long rectangular plastic crate smashed into the ground in front of the doorway. Strange threads of alien symbols wormed their way across each surface. Medical stuff, Bitey nodded firmly. Please help her, he pleaded. Samantha only contemplated how she was going to drag the massive thing through the station for a moment before Bitey solved the issue for her. His large claw hand abruptly shoved the side of the crate and launched it through the room, where it crashed into the wall only a few meters away from the injured Chacks. Sorry, he apologized as a small Chack shot him a baleful glare. I suppose I should be thankful that you even had one of those on hand. Still, be more careful, she huffed at him. Thanks for the hand. Keep an eye on Bubbles, Samantha said as she jumped into the room. Bitey turned to look for the Lee who, as in his surprise, was only twenty paces behind him. Although his sudden retreat further away earned him a leer from Bitey. They held eye contact for a few additional moments before Jask threw his hands up defensively. Hey, don't look at me like that. There was gunfire. As Samantha's eyes adjusted to the light difference inside the room, she took in the scene before her. It was utter carnage. Several bodies littered the space, both Yuli and Chak's covered in all sorts of wounds from lacerations to bullet holes or severed body parts. Desks and computers lay around in broken piles of shattered glass and rubble. The normal stone grey floor had been marked with splatterings of dark blue and orange of spilled blood or white scuff marks where various items had been scraped along the floor. The near, complete lack of horrendous smells felt strange to her, but she preferred it far more than she would consider normal. Samantha tore her attention from the rest of the room and approached the newly forged path of destruction and the injured insectoid adjacent to it. The jack slowed herself down to sit on the floor. She studied the approaching being with equal parts of caution and curiosity. I have never seen one of your kind before. What are you? Human. My name is Samantha. Intriguing. I am Mira Amber of the Once Clack Gilded Crest. Samantha reached the crate and undid a few large buckles that secured the lid. The hinges creaked as she heaved the lid off and slid it into the floor. The box was filled with a multitude of devices, labels, and fluid-filled pouches she struggled to attach names to. She blinked a few times as she spotted something that looked eerily like a nutcracker. At least bandages were universal. Her train of thought was then interrupted by a sound that translated as a sigh by her headset, Mira had picked up on her befuddlement. Start taking things out, I'll instruct you from there, said Mira. Samantha complied, removing object after object from the crate. A lot of bottles, several large sachets she personally have called pouches, and a few implements. I hope you know what all of this is for because I sure as hell don't, said Samantha. He wouldn't be much of a doctor if I didn't. Samantha arrayed her rather numerous items all in front of the chacks and gestured to them with a wide sweeping of her arm. No Sam at your service, Dr. Mira, she beamed with a smile. Mira finally put down a rifle in its entirety, made a rather silly gesture. Her posture slumped. She pointed to a series of objects in a veritable collage. Two of the white sachets in the middle, that green fluid bottle on the left, and the injector a foot away from me. Samantha collected them one by one hesitating a moment deciding whether the miniature power drill looking implement was the injector device that she was asked for. A brief affirmation from Mira clarified that it indeed was. With all of the things gathered, she knelt down and offered them up to the chacks. Mira snatched up the white sachet and tore it open, pulling out a cloth soaked in some kind of chemical. It smelled very alcoholic to Samantha's senses. She then removed the cap with a wide needle of the injector and wiped it down with the rag. The rag was discarded after she used to sterilize a small spot in her chest. Samantha watched as it seamlessly loaded a bottle into the compartment in the side of the injector, causing the display on the side to flash to life. She stabbed into the small part of her chest. With a whir, the injector came to life. The contents of the bottle were quickly emptied into the Chax's body as her mouth parts gritted against the other slightly. What was that? A lot of things. Functionally, it was a healthy dose of time. 
It's a lot better than a perservative hibernation I was in before you arrived, she replied with a noticeably stronger voice. Mira pulled the needle out of her body and fiddled with the injector. Fetch me that empty vial in the back, she said as opening the other white sachet. She used the disinfectant wipe to cleanse the needle. Samantha quickly crawled around and picked up the small glass vial that sat with a collection of others in a small clear box. Did he ever tell you why his name is Bitey? It's a very, uh, unusual title for a queen to give a knight. Samantha smirked as she handed over the glass vial. I'd say he's got pretty fitting considering those gnashes he has, uh, and thank you. My friends always say that I act like royalty. Mira stopped and stared at Samantha. You named him? He's not a knight? He said he didn't have a name, so it seemed like a reasonable thing to do. Did I commit some kind of faux pas? Mira sat up. In a sense, but ultimately no. Samantha, where is the rest of his clack? I can't... Samantha immediately shushed her and adjusted a few sliders on her omnipad to reduce the volume of the speaker so her next words came out as a whisper. Baiji is a bit touchy about that. Uh, I don't think they are uh, around anymore. I haven't seen any other jacks since we met nearly a week ago. Mira seemed to cease all activity at that statement. Samantha watched as her expression, at least what she could gauge from it, shifted from sorrow to confusion to bewilderment. You are lucky to still be alive. Samantha found that statement concerningly foreboding. She snuck a quick peek over her shoulder to look at Bitey, who seemed to have his attention thoroughly occupied by an argument with Jask. Good. He wouldn't hear them. Why? Samantha asked. Her quick shift into a serious tone startled Mira, who up to now had only seen the human's more jovial side. We don't usually tell the young ones since it's bad for their mental health, Young clacks, where its members have not developed much of the way of individual personalities, can suffer from neurological conditions if many members are unable to converse with each other. Most of the time, it usually manifests as minor bouts of depression and psychosis. Increased irritability and emotional outbursts do occur, usually violent. One of the more extreme symptoms is complete unrecoverable loss of sentience. They devolve into beasts that obey only their instincts. This particular stage for warriors is... Um, Dangerous for those around them. Samantha could only grimace. She didn't like how that sounded one bit. Mira continued after briefly taking in Samantha's dour scent. The severity of clack isolation increases dramatically with the percentage of clack absent and the duration of their absence. The evolution in such circumstances as complete isolation commonly occurs after three to four days. Usual treatment is steady interactions with other chacks. Most of the time, full recoveries can be expected... All right, I get it, Samantha interrupted, with all the serious tone. Bitey is a bomb waiting to go off. The implication stung hard. Even being around him suddenly became a huge risk. Mira loaded the glass vial into injector. The device whirred slightly as the configuration morphed slightly to fulfill an alternate function. Not exactly, no, Sam, Mira teased. This time, it was the human who was taken aback by the shift in tone. That is the normal scenario. Mighty has lacked anything resembling a Chuck's interaction for close to a week, and has yet to devolve. The only change from the standard conditions is the fact that you came into the picture. I have no clue how you managed it, but he seems to treat you, a hind leg of all things, as welcome company. You've somehow saved his sanity. Thank you. Samantha chuckled as her mood picked up. She flicked her hair back in a comedic gesture. It must have been my winning personality, she declared with a grin. It was returned with a short chuff of the amusement from an incredulous look from Mira. I've changed my mind. You are incredibly lucky to be alive. Don't be snippy, Mira. I've just saved your life too, you know. Mira looked down at the injector in her hands in contemplation. Her sensory spines wilted, taking a few deliberate deep breaths and looked back at the human. Samantha, she said, correcting her posture once more. Take this and do what I say very carefully. Her voice was clinical, focused. She returned the injector to Samantha. Mira, something wrong. My range of movement is reduced. I still need you to complete this procedure. Please move to my side and examine the wound. Sam remained crouched in front of Mira, not saying a word. Slowly, she complied, standing up and walking over to the side of the chacks, who lifted up a shriveled wing to let her get access to a thorax. Most of Mira's flank was a patchwork of broken chitin and exposed muscle. Plastic medical staples had been punched into the cracks as some kind of lost-ditched attempt 
to close the wound. Her eyes finally rested on a ragged inch-wide hole that lay in the epicenter of the damage. Samantha insert the needle all the way into the bullet hole at the slight angle and press the small button in the back. Why am I doing this? You're not telling me something. You are collecting a sample. Please continue. Why would I need to collect a sample? I won't put this off any longer. I need to know. No, what? Please continue. Vera interrupted. Sam hesitated. Okay, she said softly. A horrendous sense of disquiet had overtaken the pair. The needle went in easily gliding through Mira's flesh with ease. Mira sucked in a pained breath as the needle eventually went all the way in. That feels like it's gotten to the right place, Mira groaned. Sam suppressed the urge to shudder. She had likely pierced an organ of some kind. Samantha delicately thumbed the button. A small whir came from the injector, and she watched as the attached vial filled with a viscous orange-brown liquid. Carefully, she pulled the needle out of Mira to complete the procedure. Now pass me the device, Mira said. Samantha handed over the injector and sat down. Mira stared at the injector blankly. Her talon digits quaked as she tapped a few times on the display. Empress, please, Samantha heard her say in a trembling voice. Mira? The display flashed, an orange light blinking in and out of existence. Mira closed her eyes, head hung. Oh. I'm sorry, she whimpered. No, 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 Sam muttered. A massive thunk rocked the building as Spidey slammed a claw into the exterior wall. Samantha, I can sense her distress. What happened? Is she okay? He desperately attempted to push his way into the building to no avail. Are you okay? Sam couldn't let this happen in front of her. Not again. She scrambled towards the medical supplies behind her in a panic. We can do something. You're a doctor. We have a feck ton of supplies. We can do something. Sam. No, we can't. Sam! She turned to meet Mira's glaze. A Jax slowly shook her head. The gesture made her heart sink. There is nothing I can do. I'm sorry. End of chapter. A Bruder 2, Chapter 7. A Silent Goodbye. How will it happen? Jask asked sheepishly. The group had all settled down outside the comm station as they had decided it was better to rest away from the carnage inside the station. Samantha sat against the outside wall with her knees tucked up to her chest. Shot a venomous glance at Jask, just chose to remain silent. How long had she just sat there? A few minutes? An hour? Time seemed to lose meaning. She couldn't help but think that she wasn't feeling enough. It stung knowing that she couldn't help Mariah that she was going to meet her end soon. But despite that, she didn't feel anything more than the melancholy and failure. Maybe that was the appropriate response. After all, they had only met an hour ago. Even then, with all things considered, it didn't sit right with her to be so detached. Thankfully, Mariah began to answer. It will be quick. Severe liver damage is the closest transnation I can think of to what is occurring... Due to its current state, multiple toxic metabolites and the bloodstream will eventually... She fell silent, trying to avoid saying the words. Mariah took a moment to recompose herself, continuing in a clinical tone. Respiratory efficiency will fall suddenly. The rest of the organs don't take long to follow. Is the answer satisfactory? Jask nodded solemnly. Mighty did not react. The Chax warrior sat in front of his worker counterpart, shielding her from the sun as it clawed its way across the evening sky. To Samantha, he seemed even more unapproachable than normal. Red, did he interject or involve himself in any conversation? Instead, he maintained a hard front of stoicism as if he was letting the sadness crash against him, futilely like an ocean waves against the cliff face. Held high like a noble warrior he held himself as, Samantha saw through his facade. His sensory spines were held low against his body, and his remaining arm was held close to his chest. He flinched at every abnormal sound, but did little to observe the possible phantom threat as he would normally do. Mighty didn't ignore the grief. He was sheltering from it. Samantha asked Mariah, trying to get the human's attention, Hmm, what are the rest of your people like? That's, um... A broad question. Uh, varied, I guess. 
I don't know, we've not really been around too many aliens to know where we stand. Humans are new to the USO, Jask interjected. I don't think they have membership status yet. First contact happened like ten years ago. Twelve, corrected Samantha. First contact happened to we in 2773. She sang monotonously. It's 2785 now in our calendar. So twelve years. That explains why we don't know much about your kind, at least in my position, said Mariah. What was your home like? The planet that you were born on? Jask leaned in a bit, wanting answers that he hadn't received earlier. It's a fairly temperate planet, Arcadia too. Green Bridge was the settlement I lived in. Looked a bit like this. She gestured at the cityscape around them. A lot less despotic, and of course with a grass instead of sand. Nice parks, good shops, easy travel to the other colonies if you wanted to. My family actually managed a quick holiday to the environmental domes on Venus. I still can't believe that Snowball was apparently a 700 degree pressure cooker 400 years ago. She smiled a little, thinking back. I had a nice family, although my dad always would baby me. My mum gave me free reign to do things myself. Always said I needed my own room to grow. Mariah felt a lull in the conversation and decided to speak up. My clan sisters and I were all doctors of sorts. Almost immediately after our first steps out of our cocoons, we decided medicine was what we wanted to do. We spent nearly 40 years treating the injured and the ill. Most of us, at least. Sakela left to become a combat medic almost as soon as she decided upon her own name. No concept felt more noble than fighting for the safety of the brood. Thank you, by the way, Baiji. You've done a great service to our people. I'm sorry for what happened to your clack as a consequence. Baiji turned his head to Mariah, a little surprised by the sudden praise. The praise should be yours, Mariah. I am born to do this. You are not. You, a clack of one and a worker, chose to fight where nothing and no one had forced your hand. It is beyond mere bravery. Where are your sisters now? Jask asked. Mariah's posture slacked a little. She gestured to the station with a solemn tilt of her head, then righted itself as she replied. We followed Sakela once the call for volunteers came out. The Gilded Crest came back together after nearly two decades apart as individuals. One last hurrah to save our brood. We entered this world together. We decided that if we were to leave it, we would do so together as well. She looked back towards the station for a moment. This might be a bit of an ask, but can you bury them? It feels wrong to leave their bodies like that. The suggestion hung in the air for a few seconds before it was answered with a dark chuckle from Samantha. Damn, I was hoping you'd say something like that. But you kept ignoring what was left of your people here. I thought for a moment that your culture just didn't care. Sure, we could do something. Thank you once again. If you're gonna do it, you better do it fast. I would like to see it before I go. Samantha rose to her feet and looked at the group with a grim determination. Jask, you're helping too. On one condition, he replied sternly. We deal with the Yili bodies too. Why should we honor the killers of Mariah's clack? Mighty scowled as he too rose to his feet. Mariah didn't spare a moment before interjecting. If I get to do so, so should they. We killed them too, lest you forget. Mariah cowed. I don't know all that much about the hind legs, but they are people too. They deserve at least that much respect. Her attention changed to focus on Jask, and they should give me a reason to think otherwise. Despite Samantha's thought, it didn't take very long to prepare the graves. But it was a grim work nonetheless. A small park nearby had been found and chosen as a spot to bury the bodies. Red leaf grass and sparse shrubs decorated the space. Acrid puddles were all that remained of the flowing fountains. Sand once again started to reclaim the abandoned space as always, slowly choking the imported desert foliage. Still, it was by far the most suitable place in the city. Baiji had of course made short work of digging out the graves, using improvised tools as well as carving names into the headstones with his talents under Mariah's direction. Barely two of the eight chacks had been taken to the park before Bitey had finished his share of the work. Not content on standing on the sidelines when he had the energy to spare, he assisted in the transport too. Only an hour had passed since they started before Mariah's old clack had been laid to rest. They were arranged in two lines of four, 
keepsakes and jewelry decorated their graves. Samantha had to be told the names of the headstones since, to her chagrin, she could not read the beautiful flowing symbols that were inscribed onto them. The names of the eight people. Trails, Reste, Quameri, Vehek, Erol, Sia, Graji, and Sakena. Mariah thanked them all for laying her family to rest and asked everyone else to leave her alone to say last goodbye to her sisters. Without a word, her request was honored. Samantha returned to the station to complete their original objective of sending an SOS to Signal Satellite. Whitey and Jask left to handle the Yulee's request. The burial of the Yulee's bodies had been a very different affair. Jask said that it was tradition to burn the dead, something about releasing their souls to be carried out to sea by winds. The fallen were cremated together. Fifteen Yulee were arrayed in a dune close to the station. One by one, they were set alight under the power of Bitey's fusion rifle. Jask stood silent vigil over the flames quietly praying and watching as the ashes swirled away into the sky. The Jax warrior stood alongside him for the first few minutes. Jax thought that he would only begrudgingly do the job and storm off. Thank you for helping with this. Jask thanked him solemnly as Bitey walked away, causing him to stop. It's the least that I could do, Bitey responded. The least you could do was say no, Jask coughed. No one could make you do otherwise. I suppose I could have, but Mariah is right. It is the right thing to do. I had forgotten myself. You are no monster, Jask. Mighty reached back into his carrier pack and pulled out a small box of Yili rations. You are right too, however. No one can force me to do much. He turned to Jask as he threw the food in his direction. It landed with a muffled thump as it hit the sand in front of him. I can't sense ill intent from you anymore. You're free. Go do as you wish. Jask didn't even get a single word before Bitey had continued to stalk away from the Yuli, leaving him alone with a funeral pyre and his thoughts. Bitey mulled over his actions only a few moments prior, the crackling of the flames behind him becoming ever quieter. He considered the strong possibility that he'd been too rash, giving Jask free reign to do as he wished might endanger him, Mariah and Samantha. Perhaps he might return late at night and improvise blade to slit their throats. Jask would be more dangerous if he found a gun. That was unfortunately likely. Mighty shook his head free from his paranoid thoughts. The Yuli had no reason to interact with them. Getting anywhere near the Chaks was inviting a chance with death. He would run off to scavenge and survive back in the aqua habitation tanks. That was far more likely than him turning around to stab them in the back. Mighty would at least like the comfort of having the Clack Brothers around to watch his back. Clack Brothers that he didn't have. Mighty took a deep breath to steal himself again. He couldn't describe the feeling accurately. It was as if the parasite was writhing on his insides. The feeling wasn't painful, just deeply unpleasant. And yet it still hurt him. Would losing Mariah feel unpleasant too? Bitey didn't stop to contemplate. He was a warrior with allies to protect. If he had to defend his brood alone by the Empress, he would do just that. It's what we would have done, he thought. It's what I shall do. Another deep breath. He remembered his last time as a wee. The battle cries roared into the night sky as the city rumbled with the sounds of transports racing away to the stars. The screech of plasma weapons of all sizes, the droning buzz of workers' auxiliary wings as they carried them from building to building, the searing pain as a bullet tore one of his arms to stringy meat, the sensation of tearing off what remained so that it was not encumber him. The checks were outnumbered, and by no small margin. They fought hard for every meter to spill as much yearly blood as possible. Command had instructed them to let civilians in the city go. If nothing else, they would disrupt troop movements in the city and overburden the Lili supply lines if they got off world. He could remember the recognition pheromone being nearly blocked out by the coppery smell of Yili. The cloying smoke of the building set alight, or reactors of combat vehicles being breached. The air was thick with chemicals. 
The telltale sense of adrenaline. The fury. The perspiration. The blood. The seared flesh. The sadness. His antenna twitched. Mighty didn't recall smelling sadness that day. It was Samantha's. Scanning his immediate surroundings, he realized he was back in front of the comm station. The smell was coming from within there. He scuttled up to the building. Samantha, what is wrong? He heard a small surprise gasp come from inside the building. He startled me. Since when could you walk so quietly? The human said. I was just thinking about a few things. It's bullcrap what's happening to Mariah. She didn't deserve this. Is that why you are sad? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. There was a hint of something else mixed in for the sadness. But Bitey couldn't pinpoint exactly what. He decided to leave it. I'll keep watch over Mariah. What about Jask? I let him go. Bitey sensed a wave of worry emanating from the building. He allowed himself a short chuckle. I didn't hurt him. I don't think he is a threat anymore, so he's been permitted free reign. I'd say that's a risky move, but uh, because you, of all people, said it's fine to let him loose, I'll trust that judgment. He heard a plopping of footsteps approaching the door. Samantha emerged and looked at him in the eyes with a weak smile. Please, um, tell Mariah it was nice to meet her. You are not coming with me. Samantha shook her head. She should be with her own people for this. I will see you tomorrow, she said, retreating back inside to end the conversation. Bitey lingered just a moment before continuing onwards to the park. It was late evening by the time he arrived. The wind had died down alongside the fading sun. Normally, little else could be heard in such a place aside from the click of his taloned feet on the ground. But there was something else. Chirping. It was weak, but it was there. As he got closer, it increased in intensity as it echoed off what remained of the surrounding building's walls. Bidey didn't expect to hear such a thing again for a long time. And yet, there it was. The comforting sound. Another minute of traversal brought him to the center of the park, to the graves, to Mariah, who stared blankly at the slowly descending sun, chirping and listening intently to the sounds echo back to her. She stopped as she sensed the warrior approach, fidgeting a bit with her talons. You can keep going if you want, said Bitey as he closed within a few meters of the diminutive chucks sitting on the grass under a withered tree. Not around company, she responded, not turning to face him. Her voice was once again as weak as when they first met. And I've been made fun of if any of my sisters knew I was making a brood call by myself. They'd laugh all the harder knowing that it was in a Yili settlement. This place doesn't exactly conjure images of a safe home. She chuckled weakly. Her posture sang as she mulled over her words. I miss the nest. I'm so tired. They let the ensuing silence hang in the air for precious few moments. Samantha said it was nice meeting you. I'm flattered. She was fairly pleasant company too, even for a hind leg. Who knows? Maybe the rest of our brood would like it too. Maybe there is hope for peace with others. It would be quite a sight. Silence once again loomed over the pair. Bitey sat down next to her. He sucked in a gulp of air and let out a shorter but far more bassy chirp of his own. Mira's head shot up to look at him as he attempted to listen to the noise rebound of the structures around him, returning as if a dozen other chacks far away had called out as well. It's sort of like being back in the nest. It's nice. Mira looked away, her eyes focused on the horizon at the end of the straight street that carried into the distance. It is... Mira closed her eyes and began to chirp once more. This time, Mighty joined in. He closed his eyes as she did and took in the sounds around him. He could imagine it so vividly. The endless caverns of the colony. Carved orange rock and smelted metals. Tunnels, bustling with movement, alive with chitters. Stalls and walls crawling with checks. Laughter, arguments, and haggling. The sounds of machinery of industry in the distance. His clack surveying an area in case of disturbances that never occurred. The sounds of a city full of activity. Above it all, the noise. The calming chirping most of them made them happy. 
The brood call, the sound that told them that they were home, that they were safe, that everything was okay. It was a nice dream, one he wished desperately was real. Bite opened his eyes. Dusk was fast approaching. The world around him was saturated in a pleasant pink-orange light. Mira shuffled to lay down, her head resting on her forelimbs in a sleeping position. She let out a small, contented sigh. Her eyes were still closed, but she had stopped, chirping. Can you keep going? Please, Mira asked, her voice now barely above a whisper. Mighty nodded solemnly and continued. Thank you, she mumbled, drifting off to sleep. Thank you. The call rang out for the last remaining hours of daylight. It danced across Mira's spines as she faintly breathed in and out. It flew down desolate streets, in ruined buildings, through broken vehicles. It could be heard by a brooding human contemplating the data on an omnipad, by the conflicted Yili stalking away down the street, by a few scavenging animals who hid in the sand. It traveled on for miles, carried aloft by peaceful winds in all directions, like the light of all-encompassing dusk setting on the dunes. A welcome call to all who knew what it meant. And it went on, and on, and on. Finally, finally, the sun slept beyond the horizon. With its fading, so did the bite his brood call decrease in volume. Eventually, only cold twilight dominated the sky and the cruel silence with it as the last of the echoes fluttered away into the distance. Bitey noticed the feeling coming back, deep and heavy, far heavier than any armor that he'd ever worn, than any weapon that he could carry. He felt helpless under its oppression. It weighed down like a tunnel had collapsed on his back. Silence. Loneliness. Deep breaths, in and out, in and out. His own... There were no others. The warrior forced himself to his feet. He stretched his limbs to force more life into them. They needed to be strong against the vent of weight. He glanced down to his side, to the person that was laying beside him, to Mira, who wasn't there anymore, and yet still was. Bite his side, almost as if he could breathe out a horrid sensation that washed over him. His arm came down to lift the shape, talons wrapped delicately around its frame. Silence reigned uncontested as Bitey carried the still, cold body to be laid to rest alongside her sisters. End of chapter Chapter 8 Pensiveness and Preparation One Week it had only been one week since the battle for the soul of Yellow Red. Samantha's eyes flickered open as her body responded to the rays of light seeping through the open door of the station. She woke to a new morning as well as she slept through the previous night, uncomfortably. An improved bread roll was still not particularly pleasant, especially when laid down on a hard tile. At least it wouldn't be coated in the sand this time, a small plus. She groaned as she wiped the sleep from her eyes. Getting up was a painful affair considering her sleeping arrangements, but she had experienced worse on the slave ships that brought her to this world. A quick set of stretches would get most of the aches out. Finishing her wake-up routine, she retrieved her pack and fished out a ration and a small Yili water tank that she had repurposed as a water bottle. Its lack of weight quickly informed her that it was nearly empty. I'll have to get one from Bitey, she mumbled to herself. Crap, Bitey and uh, Mira. Samantha briefly wondered what might be running through his head at the moment. Mira had told her how acute the feeling of loss is to their kind. He was definitely not going to be in a good place mentally. Samantha gathered her things in a flurry. It wouldn't be too good to leave him alone for too long. Hesitation gripped her as she reached the final piece of kit on the floor. Her Omnipad. What would happen if she told him what she'd learned from the computers last night? She doubted he'd come off lightly with another emotional sucker punch. 
It would only be a matter of time before he found out, and then... No. She tucked the Omnipad into the holster that she had affixed to her arm. Mighty shouldn't be left alone. That was the dangerous game for both of them. His bloody smell-based mind-reading crap meant that he would likely learn it one way or another. With any luck, it wouldn't come up for a while at least. That would help soften the blow a little. She threw the pack on her back, finished her ensemble with the hooded white cloak that she'd draped over her body. Another piece of scavenged material and a particularly useful item of clothing if you wanted to avoid the burning glare of the desert sun. Samantha made a few final checks to see if the station's computers were synchronized with the Omnipad. Green marks. Good. She'd be notified if satellites picked up anything entering the system. Not a moment later, she strode out into the morning daylight, squinting a little as her eyes adjusted to the glare. Hmm, no bitey, she said as she scanned the immediate surroundings. She sighed. He'll be there then. She swallowed a then feeling of melancholy and made her way out to the park. The slightly taller buildings had meant most of the red space of the park was still draped in the shadow at this time of day. The flat patch of land near the husk of the old tree half illuminated by the beating rays of the light, the other by intermittent darkness. The delicate curve on the minuscule hill had been broken up by the prone, sleeping form of Bitey and the blocky shapes of the headstones. Her eyes traced over each one as she counted. Samantha was almost certain Mira had already passed on during the previous night, but a primal part of her mind clung to the hope that she had still lived. However, unreal it was. Five, six, seven, eight, she counted to herself. Nine. Samantha's walking pace slowed to a crawl. She stopped to rub her teary eyes as the last irrational fragment of hope was ripped away. Breathing in a few shuddered breaths, Sam took a minute to recompose herself. She started walking once more. The sound of muffled footsteps was the first sensation that pierced the veil of sleep, if only just. Bitey attempted to ignore it and continued to rest. Thump. Something was dropped next to him, but once again it only barely registered to his consciousness. There was another, smaller thump on the grass and another. Then there was a pressure on the side of his upper thorax. Something was leaning against it. This, finally, was enough to get Bitey to awaken. As his mind started to come to consciousness, information started to pour into his senses. His eyes flickered open to survey the morning light, and then I swayed as they took in the scents around him. But he turned his head to the side to observe what he'd come to realize was Samantha, sitting down on the grass and resting her back against him. I'm going to hazard a guess that you're not in the best place right now, Sam said. Bitey found the sensation of a speech strange when she was in contact with him. The vibrations from her vocal cords spoke in one language, but the translation from a speaker spoke in another. It created an odd sense of dissonance, akin to the weirdest accent that he could imagine. You uh, don't have to feel compelled to say anything. It's all right just to sit here. Mighty mulled over the offer. His head laid down on the grass once again as he contemplated. The feeling of isolation washed away, but the sadness remained I failed, was all he said. At what? I couldn't protect her. None of us could. It was a bad place at a bad time. That was going to happen whether we showed up or not. I don't like it, but uh, that's how these things are sometimes. But I've never felt so powerless, Samantha. His head rose up and he swiveled to look at her. I can rend steel and carve platoons of soldiers apart. My brothers and I could match a tank squadron with ease. But Mira, one worker with no foe for miles, light years even, she was just there. I was right beside her, and all I could do was watch her wither away. We did far more than that, and you know it, she comforted him, giving a large chunks a few small pants on his carapace. I'm sure as hell we made Mira's last day a lot easier on her. We got her peace of mind. We defended her happiness. Bitey turned to Mira's grave, lingering on the human's words and the events of the previous evening. I, um, agree. 
He turned back to see Samantha's warm, if weak smile. She said, thank you. Her last words to me were, thank you. Samantha's eyes started to water again. Her voice was tinged with emotion as she spoke. You, um, you did good bitey. He took a little comfort in that thought. It didn't drain away the negative feelings, but it was a start. He had something to take solace in. A more pleasant quiet took over briefly before the checks cut in. I'm guessing you've done your particular job of getting the SOS signal out. Samantha's mood shifted once more. He could sense a new wave of sadness. The difference in emotions he could sniff out was subtle, but they were present. It was not as acute with the passing of Mira. There was something else on her mind. Yeah, I did. We could be expecting someone to come take us away any day now, she said with a painted on smile. Anything else of interest you did in that station? Mighty inquired. Nothing worth bringing up. Mighty stared at her in quiet contemplation. Odd. You have never lied to me before, Samantha. He sensed a new kind of sadness coming over the human. This time, he knew clearly what it was. Guilt. Samantha winced and chose to say nothing more. She clearly wasn't comfortable with speaking, so he decided not to continue questioning. He did wonder for a moment as to what could be the cause of a new misery. Why did she feel guilty for not telling him? There wasn't all too much that could be in that station. Some signal relays. Perhaps a connection to the navigational satellite. Samantha would have to do that if she needed to figure out the jump signatures and flight paths of any ships entering or exiting the system. The pieces of the dread puzzle fell into place. He realized the one piece of information he could think of that Sam would want to withhold from him. My brood, the evacuation ships, he spoke solemnly, watching as Samantha hung her head. None of them escaped the system, did they? She tucked her legs in towards her chest, raising herself for the response to his question. No, but he cursed breathlessly as his fears were proven true. It's... it is... Uh, fine, Samantha, he sighed. I already knew. She returned a questioning look at the statement. We had to buy the ground forces enough time to level the city. My brood had thrown every last warship into the system at them but the Yuli still had armed fleet at the end of the battle. It was a fool's hope to believe any of my brood escaped them. Please do not feel guilty for what you did. I appreciate your intentions were impositive. He heard a brief chuckle from the human. That went better than expected, she managed to joke. But he clacked his mandibles a few times with satisfaction. He was glad he could improve his companion's mood, if only a bit. The truth stung but it was something he was previously on the road to coming to terms with. Lingering on it would make Samantha worry. The pair both rose. Samantha did so with a wide-eyed disbelief. Is that... Uh, Whitey asked. Samantha's small smile grew into a wide grin. Oh, yeah! She yelled as she frantically tapped an Omni pad. It's a ship! That's great! Whitey chimed in. Is it friendly? Samantha's glee rapidly fell away to worry. Oh, it's, uh, it's, uh, unknown. Drive signature or design does not mark a Yuli or anything else in that database of that. Could it be human? It's technically possible. Human ships aren't in the database, but any kind of confederation vessel showing up in this side of the galaxy isn't very likely. Scavengers, then. Bitey reasoned. Samantha opened her mouth to speak, but the words caught in her mouth. Probably... If we are lucky, it's a relief ship. If we are unlucky, it's, uh, pirates. She finally let out. Either way, I don't want to give up a chance of leaving. I also don't fancy being snagged and sold into slavery by marauders. Again. Bidey preened his sensory spines in thought. We'll need a plan. End of story. Chapter 9 Roll Reversal Mesh checked the firing mechanisms on his repeating heavy rifle whilst his comrades bantered with one another. He savored the small hint of anticipation, listening keenly to the rumbling of the shuttle's engines as the craft dived through the planet's atmosphere. 
Can you stop gritting, Bash? You are gonna make the other lads crap themselves at this rate. A scarred and withered house car gestured. The thumb of the three-fingered hand pointed backwards towards the rest of the landing party. Bash only grinned wider. The carmine-colored scales of the sickeningly wide crocodilian jaws being pulled taut by his facial muscles. His eyeless head turned to glare at the startled crewmates around him, each only being half his size. The forms of the yili and the kangaroo-like chirka shuddered under his gaze. The pits under his nostrils picked up the warmth of the pitiful companions. Vesh turned to face the Halkazer again. Last thing I need is this place smelling worse than it already does. Vesh chided, his voice deep and rumbling baritone. He folded his upper pair of arms over his stocky body, resting the gun on his shoulder. He pointed with his free hand at his friend, but nah, Gran, the smile is staying. You know, it's very Draktar dream to hunt something as dangerous as the bleak scales back home. Gran waved his hand to dismiss his large companion as he shouldered his sonic rifle. Yeah, yeah, I've heard it from you a hundred times already, Rotpress. It's been a week already, and you still won't bloody shut up about your fabled chance to hunt the Chucks warrior. Are you talking about fighting the Chucks again, Draktor? The Yuli asked, poking his head around the doorframe. I didn't pay you to yap enough to make me want to put a gun in my mouth when I'm around you. Vesh let out a deep chuckle. Call it enthusiasm for my job, Captain Nathione. Temper it then, we've picked up the next nothing on our scanners. We're here to see who's sending the SOS. Loot some buildings and nothing more. Yes, boss, he grumbled. After a few more minutes, the shuttle ground to a halt, resting in the center of a right roadway. Vesh was the first out the door. His thick legs eagerly propelled his bulk straight off the craft as the loading ramp came down. The multiple barrels of his weapon spun to life as Vesh charged out into the beating sun. The atmosphere burned his nostrils as the Draktar breathed deep. The serpentine tongue lashed out to taste the air, finding little to his liking. Hmph, nothing but rolled meat. What do you expect? Gran chided him. If we didn't pick anything up on the simple scans, what the hell do you think was going to meet us? I don't know. Anything? Don't want to be caught with my pants down is all. Gran winced briefly as he strode into the sunlight. The warm beams of light reflected by the dull brown of the scarred keratin plates of his carapace. Your pants are already down. You're an idiot, Vash. This is Eagle Eye to Grasshopper. Coming, Grasshopper. Over. Why are we using more nicknames, uh, Eagle Eye? Over. Tradition, Grasshopper. I have eyes and contacts. They are armed and probably hostile. Over. Samantha could faintly hear a sigh from Bitey's end of the radio. Confirmed, Eagle Eye. Do you know what the contacts are? Over. Grasshopper, I see five contacts. Two Yuli, a furry mammal with big ears and jumpy legs, and... She beheld a group from over a vantage point. The building was some kind of shopping establishment. Now only a burnt-out skeleton with the upper two stories crushed under the bulk of a lifeless Chuck's battlesuit. Samantha peeked out from underneath the head of the construct and peered through the ancient telescope. Although entirely unexpected, Sam was fairly overjoyed to have found an antique store still in one piece. It made her feel like an old-timey explorer. She scanned the landing site as briefly as possible. The form of the humanoid stood out first, along with a head covered in many small protrusions like a miniature antennae. Altogether, it looked like a horrific hybrid between an armadillo, a catfish, and a goat. One Halkazar, there are also four armed red reptilian with no eyes. They're big. There's a Draktar, grasshopper to eagle eye. The reptilian is to be considered high level threat. Please monitor them closely. Nova. Eagle eye to grasshopper, the Draktar is on the move, heading towards my location. I might need to, uh. Hold on, grasshopper. He stopped. The Draktar is on the move again, heading towards your location. Stay hidden as you can. Over. Well, this isn't great. Samantha muttered to herself. Not for you, at least, a familiar raspy voice said from behind her. 
Something tastes different. Vesh licked the air again for a good measure. It was definitely there. Something a million had been through the area. It was decently fresh, unlike the weak old bodies. Maybe only a few hours. His brain began to trace the path of the creature as more chemicals were detected. It kept going for a few hundred meters that way, he deduced. Ah, Cran, I'm going to have a wonder. I'll be back before we leave. Oh, for the love of her. If you're chasing some rodent again, I swear I'll make you deaf. Don't piss off too far. Vash gave him an affirmative wave as he made his way down the street. Whatever this mammal was, it gave off a lot of pheromones. He'd never tracked something like it before. It seemed large, perhaps a survivor. There was something else that he could not pick up as he took a few more paces. Following the faint trail of chemicals as they were picked up by the chemo receptors on his tongue. Was it a second one of its kind? Besh tilted his head to the side, facing a storage vicinity. The first sand trail was leading to some place further away, but the faint second one led right here. He'd check it for a second. Not wasting his spare moments on the planet, he rushed over to the warehouse doors and pried them open. They withstood his strength only a few seconds before bending under the onslaught of his hands. Instinctively, Vesh tasted the air and the pitch-dark environment inside the building. To his delighted surprise, there was a taste that he very much liked. A grin spread across his face once more. Vesh took a confident step into the wide-open spaces of the warehouse, reaching back to close the doors and shroud the environment in cloying darkness. The sounds of metal scraping against metal resonated through the chamber. His specialized ears deciphered the sounds, allowing him to make the shapes of his surroundings. Several emptied shipping containers of various shapes and sizes took up most of the space. A few support beams near the ceiling kept the structure up. His pit organs detected that some room was far colder than it should be in such weather. There's something stopping solar radiation getting in. It would probably stop scans too. Clever. You are just what I've been looking for. The single motion the Draktor cast his repeating rifle to the floor. With his free arms, he reached behind his back to pull out a pair of ornate scimitars. I don't know if you can understand me, but I am Vash Taldrak, and I've come for you. Long have I waited to find something that can challenge one of my kind in the dark. <laughs> come! There was no response. He paced forward a few more steps. Don't play coy now. I can taste you. You are in here. Come, kill me. We both know you stand a better chance of surviving if you try and kill me with a blade than a gun. Don't want my friends running in now, do you? I think we both know it. Mesh continued to survey the room. All his senses attuned to the cool darkness his kind were evolved to reside within. He pressed on, leaping up onto a large crate, continually tasting the air as he went. It's very close now. Where are you, beaut? From across the room, a metal container was flung at him. The clang of claws on metal reached his ears just in time to allow him to intercept the eight-foot box before it crashed into his head. The clacking of talons on the floor alerted him to the rapid approach of his quarry. Vesh cackled with unrestrained mirth as he hoisted the court container over his head and launched it at his monstrous assailant. At the speed as he was traveling, the image of his heat was blurry, but there was no doubt what it was. Wiry framed, talon forelimbs, four legs and a massive severing mandibles. The crate slammed into the floor, the attack dodged by the chacks. Vesh leapt down to meet the charging warrior. Forged blades met by metallic talons, briefly revealing the forms of the combatants to each other as their weapons rang and sparked against each other in the pitch darkness. Vesh backpedaled as Bitey swung to sever one of Vash's hands, the strike meeting a parry from a scimitar. Vesh swung the opposing blade out towards the Chax's head. The sword dug into a mandible, breaking and severing off half of it. This piece clattered to the floor alongside a few yellow drops of blood. 
he drew his sword back in anticipation to block a blow from the Chucks' other arm. A blow, to his surprise, that never appeared. Bash lunged forward to exploit the opening in the reading warrior's guard. Mighty responded by launching himself backwards to create more space between them. Vesh ground his feet into the ground to halt his momentum as he observed Bitey in his entirety. He held up his free hands and snarled. Bitey was stunned for a moment as the unexpected wave of pheromones hit his senses. His mirth had turned to... annoyance? Okay, time out, Vesh snarled. Where the hell is your other arm? End of chapter. Chapter 10 Good karma. Well, this isn't great, Samantha muttered to herself from a vantage point as she watched the Draktor march away. No, not for you at least, a familiar raspy voice said from a few feet behind her. She was startled by his sudden appearance, but managed to hide it. His tone of voice clearly conveyed that the next few minutes of conversation would not be as friendly as she had hoped. Samantha sighed as her concern seemed to double in a matter of moments. I'm not sure I'm surprised to see you again, Yask, said Sam, turning around to face him and the gun that he had trained in her. I didn't think you had it in you to be that sticky. I am getting out of here, human. I bet you will. Jask winced as he beheld Samantha's withering gaze, a look of disappointment and disgust that always seemed to drench up bad memories. Get up, he ordered. Samantha complied, slowly standing up from her crouched position. The entire time, her eyes never left Jask's own. The unnerving look remained. What are you doing? Sam calmly asked. Now, no, these kinds of people, they are scavengers, marauders. If I want off this planet, I need to join them. And to join them, I need something of worth to give them. A slave would... No, she interrupted. What are you doing? What? You know exactly what the hell I'm doing. Do I? What's the plan after you become part of the crew? After I've sold off as a slave again. Shut it. The plan is staying alive. I don't need your bullcrap. You're coming with me. You have not thought about anything past breathing the next day. Is that really it? I said shut it. Jask hissed, taking a step forward to emphasize his demand. Samantha stopped talking. Still that gaze remained fixed on him. Stop looking at me like that. You have no idea what I've done to get to where I am. I've stolen, blackmailed, and... The words seemed to catch in his throat. Her look, the situation that they were in, and the memories all blended together. He couldn't help, recalling the way his sister stared him down that fateful day. To get where you are. Jask, you were left for dead by your own people. It's a miracle that anyone came here at all. Did this end up being any better? Jask remained quiet, contemplating her words for only a moment before gathering his resolve again. Shut it! We are moving! Now! No. I don't think you're in a place to make demands. Buddy, I think the opposite. She replied as matter-of-factly, taking a step closer to Jask. The Yili raised the gun and scowled at her. Yeah, I am warning you. And what? Kill me. I am only of worth to them alive. Have you even considered that I might actually prefer death to enslavement for the rest of my life? On top of that... If they don't care if you bring something, then threatening me is pointless anyway. I... I... He let his words die in his mouth. Samantha's hand flashed out and yanked the weapon from his arms. It took Jask a moment to register what happened. But by then, she had already tossed the weapon to the side. Her gaze still unbroken. He watched as the gun skidded away across the floor. A part of him screamed to die for it. A larger part. One he did not know he had, ordered that he stared his feet. His hand, lamely reached out to the air of his determination, was ripped from his grasp alongside his weapon. Jask couldn't bring himself to look at her. He deserved what was coming next, for all he did. What he had done to escape his life on Dyth, for the trust that the monster had shown him by letting him go free, for threatening the being that had spared his life only days prior. Jask hung his head in shame. How would the human kill him? How painful would his last moments be? Jask came the disappointed sigh from Samantha. I don't know what you have done or why the hell you did it, 
but I know that you can be better than uh, whatever this was. Go with those jerks if you want. I'm staying here until someone who gives a damn shows up. As naive as that probably sounds. Samantha brought up her Omnipad and tapped it a few times. Eagle Eye to Grasshopper, what's your status over? No response. Eagle Eye to Grasshopper, do you read me over? Silence. Then a bit of crackling came over the line along with the sounds of clanging metal. Crap. Sorry, Jask, I gotta go. It was nice meeting you. See you later. The Yili raised his head slightly. Why hadn't she struck him? Was she not going to get revenge? See you later, was all that was supposed to mean. Why was she sprinting off to the side of the building? His eye shot wide open and he raced forward to stop the girl from falling to a death to no avail. Jask watched helplessly in stunned silence as she leapt off the building, catching himself on the part of the wall to prevent his own fall. His eyes traced a descent as Samantha landed on a small sand dune built up in the street and rolled with what he could only describe as a practice grace. What the feck? he mouthed whilst watching Samantha dust herself off, uninjured, and continued running. Jazz scrambled to the stairs to go after her, stopping briefly to rearm himself with his previously discarded gun. His boots started against the synth steel steps as he descended the three stories to the crowd floor. A little out of breath, he arrived there, still very perplexed as to how the girl pulled off the feet. Sure, there were a few rumors about the humans originating from a death world, or something similar. But even if that were true, three stories would have shattered her legs of just about anything, even if the gravity was lower than her species' native force. She just walked it off like it was nothing. Mustering up more energy, Jask pressed on jogging out the door closest to where she landed and taking in his surroundings. He couldn't see her anywhere. Great. What should he do now? Trying to catch up with the human would be difficult, considering the pace she moved. Knowing her, she had probably run off to find Chax. Bitey was large, but he'd lost track of him earlier and he'd only followed Samantha. That was out of the question. Then there were the Marauders. They would be at least way off the planet. Hopefully... The next group to show up on the planet, even if they did, would probably be either the Chucks or members of the Yili Commerce Guild. He didn't think either would care much for his life. Ah, fine, pirates it is. He stormed down the side of the street where the group had passed by a few minutes earlier. He crested the corner of the block to find a shuttle they arrived in. Two guards stood Stentinel outside and cobbled together craft. This plan was reckless, he thought to himself. Did this even count as a plan? Damn, Samantha was right. The hell am I doing? Jask threw his gun on the floor to get the attention of the two pirates standing guard. A pair of poorly outfitted Yili. They both raised their weapons at him. Hands on your head, Covergills. Jask squalled his nose before speaking up. I am a militia member of this colony, Jask Antheon. Trooper rank corporal number 2361. I want to join your crew, he stammered out. It was not his intention to give his credentials, but some old habits die hard. The two guards shot perplexed looks at each other. One activated their omnipad and spoke into it in a hushed voice. Stay right where you are, Jask. Uh, yes, sir. All he could do was stand and wait for something to happen. They had not decided to kill him on sight, which was a good sign. Jask wondered how Samantha planned to leave the planet. Maybe the Chucks would be amendable to her considering Bitey seemed to like her. What kind of name was Bitey anyway? Knowing how they named the planets, it didn't seem too off for them to be name him something like that. Hold on one second. Wasn't the work of Chucks named Mira? That's a normal name. Why was he named Bitey then? What are the chances? Jask heard someone say in the native Dithic tongue. Lower your guns, lads. It's not a problem, uh, the guards relaxed a curt nod to the figure that was approaching from behind Jask. Noticing the lull in tension, Jask spun around on his heel, his mouth falling agape at the person that saw it before him. Uncle Dutch! The captain's grin turned into a wide smile at the sight of his nephew. One and the same smile, Fry, although I go by Captain Athion these days. How are you, Jask? He struggled to pull himself from his amazement. Was the human some kind of good luck charm? The stars constantly seemed to align wherever she went. Maybe it's his own luck 
and being captive of a monster and an oddly friendly alien had earned him a chunk of karma. I... I've been better. Dutch let out a small chuckle as he closed the distance and slapped his nephew on the back playfully. It certainly does look like it. I have not seen you worse for wear since you sent my brother to the pyres. Jas grimaced at the mention of what he had done to his father to earn his stripes. What? Don't give me that look. He was a jerk anyway. Besides, you got the gig with the kobold fang lads for it. Happy days. Yeah, happy days, he said with a faint smile. Well, with the pleasantries over, we have to get out of here. Pronto. Why? The bugs are back. Sensors picked up a fleet about a minute ago. We have to be out of here yesterday. At this point, Jask had no idea how to react. It seemed that every other moment something new happened to catapult his emotions from one extreme to the other. Hope to shame to panic to frustration to shame again. Before we had found anything worth around here, kid, but the tech meat for the markets. The opportunity expected. An easy ticket into his uncle's good books. No, nothing like that. Just me and Bitey to keep me company, Jas surprised himself with the response he gave. The human had gotten to him, but it felt right to not sell her out. Dutch also seemed surprised, but Jask realized that it was due to a different part of his statement. Oh, Bitey is a chax that's been following me around for the past week. He's friendly enough, but not great for conversation. Jask elaborated with a far more genuine smile on his face. Oh, for the love of... Ah, I knew that he was up to something. He just couldn't leave it alone, could he? The Hacklesar exclaimed as he overheard the conversation. Everyone on the shuttle, I'll short out Vash. Dutch rolled his eyes and the rest of the crew nodded in affirmation. Jask followed them up the metal ramp, pausing briefly to look over the ruins of the Port Gale one last time. Good luck, Samantha. May fortune continue to smile on you, he whispered to himself. His last parting words before departing on his new life for the second time. For once, without guilt. Neither of the combatants moved in the darkness as Bidey contemplated what he'd just heard and smelt. Was diplomacy even an option in regards to a Draktar? If combat continued, the Draktar would surely kill him. It was worth a shot at least. Hesitantly, he cocked his head as a sign of confusion. What do I mean? Fesh interpreted the motion. Honor your bloody arms are missing is what I mean. This ain't a straight fight. No combat simulation his clack went through had taught him how to deal with this type of situation. Mighty tentatively reached for the abdomen and switched to his new personal translator on. I, I suppose it isn't, he responded. Hold on, since when can you talk? Since the start. Have you been speaking to me without knowing this? No. Bitey narrowed his eyes, nothing more than a symbolic gesture in the gloom which they currently resided in. The retractor, Vesh, Bitey believed he declared himself, didn't give off any chemical signals that he could interpret. Vocal cues proved far harder to gain insight into. He'd just have to take a face value despite the feeling that there was something deeper to the way he pronounced the words. That's beside the point, warrior, Vesh said again. I gotta do this again with different rights. <clears throat> Bitey found his entire situation beyond absurd. Are the rest of the Draktar as strange as you? Bitey inquired. <coughs> Bitey had enough wisdom to know when he was being told to silence himself. Warrior, I am Bash Tald. The door to the warehouse slammed open. Sunlight drowning out the copious shadows, both large soldiers heard a rapid stomping of feet against the floor of the structure. After a brief moment... The figure causing the gnolls appeared before them. Vesh observed the creature. He had never seen such a thing. Although structurally similar to most species in the USO, his pits noticed something incredibly peculiar about this warm-blooded being. Her walking limbs were cold. Bitey, are you okay? The creature asked, taking up some kind of amateurish battle stance. She looked around at what she thought was going to be a combat, but had somehow broken down. No one present did anything for a few seconds. I'm confused. What's going on here, Bitey? Samantha asked. The Chuck spoke up. The drug tar has challenged me to a duel, I think. I did, Vash declared. Samantha's posture relaxed slightly and her brow furrowed, imperceptible to the drug tar standing in front of her. You aren't just going to kill him? She asked, silently wondering where the reptilian creature's gun that she'd seen earlier was. Not unless I have to. 
He's injured. Therefore, this duel is unfair. Professionals have standards, Vash announced proudly. Samantha merely stared at Vash in utter bewilderment. She could barely comprehend someone so incompetent on the battlefield being alive long enough to be considered a professional. Was I? He muttered as he scratched his head with one of his drawn scimitars. All right, uh, I had to do a void of declaration. I am... Vash, you piece of crap! You better not have gone looking for that Chax! Cran interrupted over the combead on Vesh's shoulder. The Draktar sighed, holding up one of his four hands to the human and his opponent. Both looked at one another and backed away slightly. It was a safe bet to allow him to continue with his antics. Vesh tapped the cum. I have! What of it? I Can you leave me alone? I'm busy. Get your ass back to right now! We have vac orders! Samantha's Omnipad beeped a few times, considering the dangerous gladiator standing before her was more pressing issue. She elected not to read the new notification. Vash sighed, assuming a battle stance. I wanted a straight duel, but it seems my ancestors wished to humiliate me. I refuse to leave here in pieces. Wait on a sec. Crikey, Sam implored the reptilian. Could you just let us go? We will let you return to your crop peacefully. Vash pondered her request, looking between the chucks and the human. Only if the chucks swears to engage me in honorable duel at a later date, when he has recovered from his injuries. Samantha shot an imploring glance at Bitey. Perplexed, but feeling an odd sense of pride at the offer, Bitey straightened his posture, as if awarded honor. I can agree to such terms. Vash grinned. He reached into one of his breast pockets in his combat harness to procure an ID badge promptly tossing it over to the chucks before stomping out of the building. I shall see you in battle one day, Bitey, said Vash as he left the warehouse. Bitey and Samantha gawked at the entrance as the Draktar ran off the street. He let us go, just like that. Who was that guy? Samantha asked. Vash Taldrak. That guy nearly had my head before you showed up. He just stopped the fight after seeing you were crippled. Bitey's spine shivered, a shrug. Samantha shook her head. I have no idea if that's chivalrous, dumb, or both. Yeah, your mandibles don't look good. Do they heal? I will repair themselves in time, he answered, tracing his hand over his broken mouth parts. What about you? Are you well? Oh, I'm fine. I had to run in with Jask, and I gave him a bit of a talking to, and we parted ways. That's good to know. The pirates departing so soon is also good news. Bitey stretched his limbs to relax the tension in his muscles. What a strange series of events. Yeah. Today has just been a roller coaster. For the moment of tension diffused, Sam looked down at her omnipad. Excitement once again washed over her. Holy hell. An entire fleet has been detected closing in from the outskirts of the system. They're broadcasting some kind of... Bitey observed Samantha's expression shift to utter glee, matching the scent of happiness radiating out from her. Even more good news. No way! Oh, I think you'll want to hear this, she said with a smirk. With a few carefully placed taps, the broadcast played from her omnipad, clicking and chirping sounds of the Chuck's language resonated along Bitey's sensory spines. This is Opal Queen Kalani. High Queen of the Opal Brood, siblings from the Amber Brood, if you can hear this message, please respond. End of chapter. Chapter 11, Official Procedure Do you remember what I instructed you to do? Bitey inquired for what Samantha believed was the first time that hour. If I said I would be completely ignore any of the old directions you gave me, if you asked me that question once more... Would you stop asking? Samantha sassed him. She winced as the night desert winds blew a cloud of dust into her face. Communications with the Chak's fleet had been rocky. There had been a lot of solemn information exchanged as to the condition of the Amber Brood's colony. Unfortunately, so too there were more than a few suspect questions towards Bitey's mental health in regards to his chosen companion for the past week and a half. The diatribe, however, had ended rather abruptly after their second hour. The officer that they were discussing with received a new message to relay. They were to go to the edge of the cityscape and await arrival of an envoy to collect them. Samantha found the entire endeavor unnecessary. 
Surely, they could have had all the small transport shuttles land on the street to whisk them away. Mighty, however, insisted on not arguing with the rescuer's request and complying, dragging a grumbling Sam with him the whole way. By the time they had arrived at the city outskirts, night had descended, bathing the continuous expanse of rolling sand and soft glow of the starlight. Mighty narrowed his eyes. Bit by bit, he was getting better at mimicking her mannerisms. I'm being serious, Samantha. You already know my kind are not fond of yours. Any slip-ups and you'll probably be thrown to the next ship heading for a holding colony. You'd never go back to your people. Wait, holding colony? Yes, one of the few places we keep captured hindlegs. We cannot safely return people on ships marked for instant destruction and executions are out of the question. Better treatment than I would have guessed from most races in the U.S. already. We'll be fine. I have you to smooth things over, right? Mighty stared at her for a moment. I am conflicted, he said, choosing then to switch the focus of his attention to the desert. Mm -hmm. I would greatly appreciate to see your comeuppance for your uh, willfulness, but I fear how severe the consequences might be. Mighty... I was a slave for half a year. I should be allowed to enjoy some well-earned willfulness. She remarked with a smile. Come on. I should be allowed to be excited. I get to see more alien cultures. I could probably write my dissertation on this. If I get back to my university, that is. She let out a begrudging sigh as she noticed by his attempt at an irritated look. I do get what you mean, though. I'll try to be more, um, restrained. Thank you. Now, one last time. Do you remember... Banap, banap, do you remember what I told you? Yes, that was a joke, he retorted. Samantha raised an eyebrow and shot him a stern knock. He was still learning what all the facial contortions meant, but the scent and her emotions filled the gaps in his understanding. Mighty clacked his mandibles. Hind legs, he muttered disparagingly. I heard that. Her omnipoire beat twice, eliciting the woman to tap once and the device to close the notification. The shuttle should be heading down right now. She scanned the skies with a giddy expression. Her eyes darted between the multitude of glimmering lights that hung in the sky, trying desperately to pick out the one moving object that represented their rescue. Then, she saw the moving star gliding across the night sky. Moment by moment it grew closer and larger. And larger. And larger. Her excitement lessened as the craft's rough shape could be made out, it was angular, almost arrow-shaped. She couldn't help but compare it to utilitarian cylindrical shapes of human designs. It was at this point she noticed that, despite being quite a ways away, she could still discern a lot of its shape. Mighty, are all your shuttles normally that big? No. Is it not a shuttle, then? She asked with a hint of worry in her voice. Was it a ground attack? No. If they wanted a dead, simple orbiting bombardment, would have done the job easily. The ship slowed down as it approached, taking up more and more of the sky ahead of them. Yes, uh, I think that's a corvette. Alternatively, it's a... Um, oh. Mighty immediately lowered himself to a kneeling position. His rear legs folded to reduce his height as the first set of knee joints and the forelegs hit the sand. Samantha, assume a respectful stance. Vast clouds of sand swept out from the directions as a 200-meter grain vessel came into land, smaller gravatic impellers making minor adjustments into its position. Samantha's white cloak billowed as the winds scraped against her. Why are you, uh, why, what should I be doing? You didn't explain this, Samantha babbled, anxiety overtaking her incitement. Landing struts extended outwards from underneath the ship and wedged into the sand as it came to a dead stop. I don't know how hind legs show reverence to royalty. Do whatever seems appropriate. R -r royal it's the queen, she yelled at him excitedly. Samantha, restraint. Yes, yes, sorry, she said, taking a knee. A hiss erupted from the ship. Samantha watched as a massive loading elevator descended from the ship. Dozens of figures leapt off as soon as the platform cleared a few meters from the hull. The air filled with a deep droning buzz of insectoid wings as white carapace workers jacks hovered around Bitey and Samantha, all of which were armed. Returning her gaze to the platform, she beheld her would-be envoy.
surrounded by an honor guard of warriors, was the largest Chax Samantha had ever seen. A behemoth twice the size of the soldiers that surrounded her and utterly dwarfing the pair of workers that stood beside her. A fine white fur coat hemmed at the end of the thorax covering her upper body with emerald studded epaulets capping each of her four shoulders. Draped over her entire form was a royal blue of a satin cloak, which dragged along the floor behind her as she walked. The slight tilt in her head and she beheld the human in turn caused the diamond decorated silver chain headbands to clink against each other. The queen stepped off the platform as soon as it made contact with the ground, the various pieces of jewelry glittering as she and her entourage made their way towards Mighty and Samantha. Opal came to a standstill only meters away from the pair. She recalled the hovering workers to the ship with a short chirp. The departure of the soldiers returned to the desert to its natural quiet, the delicate shifting of sand being the only source of noise. Show off, Samantha remarked under her breath. The queen silently inspected the human for a moment. I heard that, she accused, the clicks of her voice ringing loudly in Samantha's ears. In that moment, she felt her heart jump into her mouth. Mighty, likewise, felt his own wave of dread. Of course the human had to run her mouth off as soon as the savior, none other than Spraopo Kalani, second seat to the Commonwealth Council, came within earshot. Is the human always this cheeky warrior of Clack Rust Talon? She asked. She, um, uh, yes, matriarch. Mighty started out in turn, trying in vain to steady his nerves. Opal acknowledged his response with a harumph. She returned to facing Samantha, noticing how the girl had her head bowed this time. So then, I have heard some things from my officer's report. Some rather interesting things. Samantha had to suppress a shudder as her instinct screamed out. Although she was finding a sudden interest in the arrangement of the sand grains below her, she held little doubt about the T-Rex-sized alien was staring daggers at her. Let us start small, shall we? Who and what are you? She swallowed her nose. Hopefully, the High Queen would be amendable to a weak slave girl act. S -s -s Samantha Poway, Matriarch, I, I, uh, I'm human. Opal continued to silently study the creature leading before her. After what felt like a millennia, she spoke once more. What happened to the quippy girl I saw a moment ago? I liked her better. Samantha shot a quick glance at Bitey. He likewise returned one of his own. Don't play coy, I can tell. I've seen enough of my daughters trying to deceive me by playing meek. They are better at an act than you are by a wide margin. Hey, in my defense, I can suppress whatever bullshit chemicals you can smell. <coughs> um, pardon my language? Samantha shot back, her confidence buoyed by the slight against her performance. Well, that explains that, I suppose. Opal mused aloud. Amber warrior, can you vouch for this hind leg's integrity, despite her unique choice of words? Yes, matriarch, Bitey answered. He thanked the Empress Opal didn't take offense to Samantha's remark. Good, human, do you have any preferred titles? Samantha, or oh, just Sam is fine, uh, uh, matriarch, she responded sheepishly, a little taken aback by the queen's change in tone. Sam, then. Are you aware of our normal protocol regarding interaction with non funds? I believe so. Bitey told me something about a holding colony. The young warrior cringed inwardly at the mention of his unofficial title. Unfortunately for him, Samantha's slip of the tongue did not go unnoticed. Even a few of Opal's warriors chittered uncomfortably at the name. Having heard the rumors of the Amber Brood warrior being stuck with only a hind leg for company, being referred to with such a name seemed like an additional layer of torture. Bitey, hmm? You've been called this the entire time. Oh, you poor thing, Opal tittled. Back on topic. Considering you seem to be far less fearful of my mere existence than what is considered normal for hind legs, I get the feeling that sending you straight off to Celestis B2 would be doing you a disservice. I'm inclined to agree, Matriarch. What do you suggest? said Samantha. A chat in private would do nicely, I reckon, at least to decide how to proceed. Opal then turned back to the ship, 
choosing to walk a narrow semicircle as to not tread on a clock. Come along then, you two. With the two small gestures of their own forearms, the entourage snapped to attention and boarded the loading platform. Bitey released a breath that he did not know that he was holding. He spoke as snapped on Samantha, who was already on her feet and following the High Queen. What was that? Bitey chastised the human. He rushed up to keep the pace with her. Did you forget every piece of advice I gave you? I don't get why you're mad. Uh, I was polite. Uh, I used the proper titles and you insulted her, he hissed, glancing around nervously as he realized he said it too loud. It was banter, but besides, uh, she found it endearing. If I, you, uh, how you managed to get this bar unharmed is beyond me, Bitey sighed. The flight up to the ship, which turned out to be a flagship for the whole Chax Navy, was more tense than Samantha had anticipated. Opal seemed almost nonplussed by the pressure of her hind legs beside her. The same could not be said for the rest of the Chax. Sam's enthusiasm for a new situation fell away at the numerous odd glances from the Queen's entourage. Only a few of those were curious. The majority were wary. She shuffled in place as she steadied herself. The resentment of aliens was well earned. By all regard, she had been friendly for a week and was now being treated like an honored guest. Samantha had resigned herself to weathering the distaste for her in silence. Her companion, however, did not. Crack! Mighty snapped her broken mandibles together to break the silence as he glowered at the Queen's guards. A challenge! The surrounding warriors were startled by the sound. The largest of them scowled back. Samantha, on the other hand, was equal parts intrigued by the display, and very worried as to the results. You seek to insult us, youngling, the snow carapaced warrior snarled. What slight have we committed against you? You look at the human as if I've brought a threat before the queen, opposed to an ally. I will not allow such disrespect to my judgment to pass, especially from untested warriors. None of the surrounding warriors balked at the statement. The jacks gritted their mouth parts and made no retort, almost as quickly as the conflict erupted. It was silenced. Bitey was younger than them, but he held the combat experience of the scars to prove it. They must abide by his authority. Boys and their honor, Opal tutted, barely audible over the chittering mouth parts as cowed soldiers muttered under their breaths. I can imagine this is a common occurrence then, Samantha asked. Opal craned her head down to face the human. Of all the things to survive a complete societal reform and then make it into space, it had to be these pissing matches. I should probably be thankful this kind thing died out of my people a thousand years ago. Lucky you. It's not all been bad, thankfully. Lucky you. It's not all been bad, thankfully. I'd struggle to count the amount of scuffles this has prevented over the years. That is, of course, not to mention the amount of scuffles it has caused over the years. Opal jested, eliciting a small chuckle from Samantha. The transport shuddered as it landed within the berth. At least it has rained in my, uh, great, great grandkids. The boys don't get as many outlets of those other broods, being spaceborn and all. Spaceborn? Samantha inquired as the landing platform descended. Oh, hind legs, right. My mother was genetically engineered so that a brood would be adequately adapted for life in space. A few hundred years later, and here the opal brood still are, residing in our metalwork burrows amongst the stars. Few hundred? You must be quite the wise and lady then, Samantha said, her smirk falling to slack-jawed amazement at her surroundings. The slow descent of the landing platforms revealed the cavernous environment of the battleship's iridescent hangar, inch by inch. First, it was numerous gloomy walkways extending every which direction, each with human-sized worker chacks clambering along their lengths. Next, to be revealed was a smaller short-range spacecraft handling from the purpose-built clamps attached in service walkways. Next to come in sight was an entourage on the floor of the hangar. A band of twenty or so warriors snapped to attention at Opal's appearance at the scene. Many workers stared at Samantha, once again with a mixture of wariness and curiosity. Everything seems to be moving to Sam's eyes. Smaller chucks whirled about on the walls in conversation or else entering and exiting openings to other parts of the ship. 
Various shuttles were being refueled and undergoing checkups. You don't know the half of it. Compared to the queens on the council, I'm a fossil, she chuckled. I suppose the Empress is comparable, but she's only half my age. Honestly, I've wanted out of this job for ages, but my daughters refused to vote me out. By this point, I thought they would have decided upon someone they believe is more competent, and yet, uh, here we are. The platform came to a stop. Opal refocused her attention to the crew momentarily. I will be taking the human to my quarters for discussion. Delsri, prepare the diplomat room for her arrival in the meantime, along with some way for... Hmm? Opal turned to the warrior of the Amber Brood, considering something. Warrior of the clack rusted Talon, under my authority as Matriarch of the Stars, second seat to the Commonwealth of Chax Broods, in the absence of the High Queen, Amma Calsatus, in recognition of your deeds to the Commonwealth, I shall title you. The ensemble around her, aside from Samantha, promptly knelt at the declaration. Bighty himself was stunned. A title, here, yeah, now, by our High Queen. Recalling his mental faculties, Bighty took a knee. From now on, you are knighted. Stand as a clack of one. Sarkus, Amber. Samantha let out a low whistle as Bitey, now Sarkis, held his head proudly. Now then, prepare a room for Sarkis too, Opal commanded. Thank you very much, Matriarch, Sarkis spoke, bowing in respect. But I must speak up. As a knight, tradition demands I will need a queen to follow. Opal looked puzzled for a moment before stepping back in realization of what he meant. Oh, you're quite the young one. Right, uh, you can't serve outside your brood until full, full maturity. Yes, matriarch, I'm afraid I'm unable to serve you, he said dourly. Opal brought up one of her hands to preen her sensory spines in thought. Glancing down at Samantha, she stopped. Dalsri, Opal said, a hint of mischief in her eyes. What is the protocol regarding the election of a provisional queen? End of chapter. Chapter 12. Tea with the Queen Jack's tea was something Samantha was quite interested to try. That was until she actually tasted it. She shuffled about on the couch, merely designed for a being more long than tall as her tongue scraped across her palate. The drink was earthy and fresh with a herbal taste right at the forefront of her mouth. Paradoxically, this also a meaty and thick like some kind of beef soup, despite being very much flavoured water. The more she ruminated on the flavors, the more it seemed to come to her senses. It was not unpleasant, per se, but... Wait. No, never mind. It was weird shoe leather aftertaste. She placed the cup on a small table beside her. All righty then, Kalani. What do you want to discuss? Samantha said, adjusting the jeweled okra sash that rested on her torso. It was a marking of a queen of importance. Or, at least, the identifier of someone who held the rank of queen, but not the body. Samantha's titling as a queen had apparently been based on a system implemented during the unification of the Ven Sky. It turns out, despite being evolved from a eusocial species, sapience allows individuals to realize when they have been treated unfairly. As the first Commonwealth Empress made strides in the novel concept of mutual cooperation opposed to annihilation between broods, some notable queens met spectacularly brutal ends at the hands of their own workers' daughters. Over the centuries, even the most powerful queens had to submit to the concept of democratic rule. Even Opal, who relaxed opposite Samantha, only begrudgingly held her office on the grounds of her experience and the will of her underlings, assigning to her position as a high queen unfailingly every single election. Although in Samantha's case it was a small ask from Sarkis to elect her as the Amber Brood's new queen, followed by an official recognition of another queen which Opal gave graciously. Opal sipped her own, albeit titanic, cup of tea. The sound of slurping became a din within the cavernous chamber that was her personal quarters. I want to know why you are what you are, Opal said. Samantha was taken a bit aback by the statement. She thought that it would be something a bit more political, but then again, she was just a freed slave in their eyes. Is there a particular reason why? Samantha asked tentatively. I might get to that, but let's start simple with a few more details than our first foray into conversation. 
Who are you? I am Samantha Poe. I am a citizen of the Solar Confederation, a civilization made up of other humans like me. We are a proud people who value progress and the lives of others. We have done a lot of things in our past. Some things good, others bad. Others so terrible that we wear the shame of it, even now. You are not very good at displaying your kind in a good light, Opal bantered. This isn't any point in lying into a bloody mind, readers. Besides, I'm not finished. I know, she replied, taking another monstrous drink of tea. Samantha reluctant to ignore the mind-reading joke. Anyways, um, it's because we've done bad things that we strive so hard to do better. Each mistake that's been made tells us how to do better next time, and to not repeat them, she said poignantly. Mistakes are how humans learn to better themselves. Hmm, what do your people want? Opal asked next. Well, uh, that's a bit varied. Everyone wants their own thing. I think wealth and power ranks pretty high up there, she said with a sheepish chuckle. But, uh, it can't just be about anything. I was never for that kind of thing. I was always told my head was full of dreams. I remember hanging off my dad's arms whenever he'd get back from his meetings when I was a little kid. Oh, he was a diplomat, by the way. So I, uh, I just listened to him talk about all these places and people that he'd met and I just, uh... Samantha waved one of her hands as she tried to find the words. I just wanted to experience that for myself. A decade later, I've started studying to be a xenoanthropologist. End of first year, I like to join a lovely field trip to a distant star system to seek out new life and new civilizations to boldly go when no man has gone before. Although it was a place already scouted out, safety concerns and all of that, she said. Opal noted the small downturn in her emotions. One, they quickly fell away back to Samantha's usual joviality. Now admittedly, getting our research transport ambushed by a gang of marauders and then getting hauled off across the galaxy to be sold as slaves wasn't part of the plan. Despite that, I uh, think I got to live out my dream uh, in a roundabout kind of way. Opal lowered her mug, eyeing the human with disbelief. By being slave labor, she retorted. No, 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 I mean, um, Samantha scratched the back of her head. I've seen a new life. Those bastard Yili, the other slaves I met, the chucks, such as uh, Baiti. Sarkis, Opal corrected. Baiti, I'm a queen. I may call my knights by whatever our names I desire. She shot back with an impish grin. Touche, Opal responded. Continue. Where, um, I've seen new civilizations. Yes, a good few of which whilst in shackles. And now the chucks, who we humans have apparently never heard of. And finally... I've got to where no human has gone before, I think. No, I'm fairly sure. I didn't see any other humans on Gale. They'd house us together otherwise. Do I adopt a misting outlook if I've ever seen one? Opal mused. I think it's better to see the glasses half full rather than half empty. Or something something. Don't cry over spilled milk. By that you mean... All right, not human, uh... It means to focus on the good rather than the bad in any given situation. Uh, and uh, the other phrase means you shouldn't needlessly worry yourself over things you can't change. I see, Opal pondered out loud. With sayings like that, hardship seems to be an integral concept to your species. I guess you could say that, Samantha chuckled. Colonizing new planets has historically been a bit of a difficult undertaking, considering all the environmental differences. Wouldn't the United Species Organization just identify suitable planets for colonization? About that, um, we're not in the USO. It's been over ten years, and we're still being vetted. I have not heard much more from my dad about that, though. Wait, so, um, you attempted to colonize planets not suited to your biology. Did you genetically engineer your kind like we did? Well, uh, we didn't genetically engineer our people to make things easier. Samantha said. Opal was intrigued. Jack's intelligence had informed them that so far no species had required over a year to pass a vetting for membership. Then there were the attempts from the humans to colonize unsuitable worlds and her use of the word engineer. They were doing something to make the Zaneshi Sentinels, who the head of the organization, uneasy. Opal put down her half-empty mug of tea on the table beside her. Would you care to elaborate on what you mean by that, Samantha? 
Opal requested. She sensed her emotion switch to slight uneasiness, then to something else more positive that she couldn't quite pinpoint. Okay, sure. I think my point will be best illustrated by a physical demonstration, but don't go all squeamish on me, Samantha responded. This is, uh, going to be different, Opal thought. Samantha rolled up her right trouser leg, stopping at the fold halfway up her thigh. Next, she dug her thumb into the outside of her right thigh where the limb met her hip. The human face contorted with concentration as she dragged her digit increments an inch around her joint, up with force, and then a little to the left, then down with a semicircle motion. Oval got more confused when the knuckle of her index finger got involved. Then there was an incredibly faint pop. And there we go. I've got about the fifth latch. It's been a while since I had to do this, Sam admitted. Do... Opal began before losing a train of thought as the human nonchalantly removed her entire leg. Opal couldn't help but gawp. There wasn't any fanfare, no blood or smell of lacerated tissue. It just came off. After the initial moment of shock passed, she realized what it was. Is that a prosthetic limb? Opal asked. She had stopped herself, recoiling from disgust imitation, the merging of living and non-living. Almost. It's cybernetic, Samantha responded proudly, resting it across her still-attached leg and slapping the detached one. Standard issue Arcadia too. My other leg, hip joint, and most of my spinal column is the same. That is... Uh... Oval tried to put the right words together. Horrifying, disgusting, distasteful. Perhaps different would be appropriate to not hurt her feelings. And Sam just, uh... Sam was smelling smug. Or oh, was that mischievous? Opal started laughing. So that was what the human was feeling. She knew that this was how she would react. What? Sam said. That, Opal started, pointing at the mechanical leg, is probably why the council is still vetting you. That is standard on your world, by the Empress. The other hind legs must think that you are freaks. Uh, don't the hind legs see you as freaks? Samantha retorted. Opal took a moment to steady her breathing. Once again, human, touche. Continue. Why do you have those? Well, as I said, we didn't genetically engineer our people. Genetic modification is, uh, kind of very illegal in the Solar Confederation. Yes, genetics is where you draw the line, not embracing cold steel into your flesh, Opal remarked, picking up her mug of tea from where she'd left it on the table. It's carbon composites and silicon, and uh, there's a reason for it, but that's something for later. Anyway, cybernetics were already a decently common place of spaces. These days, more or less everybody has some kind of metal in them. So when we came to colonize habitable exoplanets, a decent amount had too high gravity, and so our standard biological setup had to be, uh, upgraded. Opal nodded to signal her understanding. She had a good reason to believe where this was going. If a small fall of a meter or so could shatter your legs then you'd either be better legs or not make mistakes. Considering it's humans we're dealing with, no mistakes is not an option. And so, as a species, you decided to commit a cultural faux pas that makes most sapiens in the galaxy feel visceral disgust, so you could live on planets that you would otherwise die on. Does it sound better if I said that the reduction of living tissue reduces your PMR? You need less calories if you have less legs, said Samantha. I suppose that would ease the demand on food supplies, Opal joked darkly. She lowered her mug once more. Her tone shifted to something more contemplative. I think I'm starting to understand how the hind legs feel when they look at my own people. Um, it's not so bad, Samantha said, as she popped her leg back into place and thumbed around the subdermal buttons and latches. Takes a bit of getting used to, but it's easy enough to get over. You think your humans could overlook my appearance? That of my brood, of my species. Oh, easily, Samantha dismissed her concern. Before first contact, we thought aliens would probably look like horrendous squiggly tentacle balls. In comparison to what we had prepared ourselves for, 12 years ago, uh, the jacks are tame. Opal tittered at the notion of hind legs naturally finding jacks non-threatening. Well, from one apparent freak to another, it is a pleasure to know you. Uh, we're not freaks, Opal, Sam responded warmly. Opal to the head. I remember Bitey saying something to a friend of ours. 
Who's more likely to be the monster, the pests, or those who deemed them so? Or something along those lines, she parroted the phrase. I believe that what you are is a matter of perspective. Sure, the idea of what I am might make you feel uneasy, but it doesn't stop you seeing me as Sam, the human. It's your actions that really tell people what you are. Set the human with illegal cybernetic modifications to a chucks with illegal genetic modifications, Opal replied. Only in the USO, and it's the same group with legal slave labor. It's not legal by USO law, but I suppose it might as well be with how much it is overlooked. Opal finished the last of a drink and slowly rose to her feet. Thank you very much for your company, but I am afraid I must end this conversation here. Free time is something I do not possess a lot of. Ah, well, it was a pleasure talking to you with High Queen Opal Kalani of the Opal Brood. Sam said as she stood up. Opal bowed slightly. The pleasure is mine, Amber Samantha Pawey, human queen of the Amber Brood. Opal took a few steps to the side of the room and opened the compartment on the side of the wall. She pondered for a moment as to the consequence of handing over such a thing, and then decided immediately to do so. But more things, Sam, Opal called out, prompting the human to stop as she reached the gargantuan doorway. The Chax Queen delicately plucked a comparatively tiny canister from a place in the compartment and tossed it to Sam, who had no issue catching the foot-long object. It's a pheromone cleanser. Some of the queens need it when they are young, if they struggle to contain themselves, or simply remove odd odors. I thought you might want it. Your thoughts shouldn't be privy to everyone around you. Opal watched as Samantha thanked her for the gift, and hurriedly strode out the room. Almost as soon as she'd left, she heard Sarkis greet her. Then came the sounds of a spray nozzle, cackling, hissing, and then an argument. Last thing she heard was something about Sam fulfilling a promise made to herself and the irritated Bitey complaining before the door closed fully. The human had been everything Opal had hoped for. No, the human had been everything that they expected of her hind legs when they met them a hundred years ago. With her proclivities considered, there could be no doubt that the walls and other hind legs instigated were not some kind of moral or fundamental genocide. It was a disguise for some economic or perhaps political reason that left the possibility that those reasons could be overturned or made obsolete. Their peace was truly achievable. Unless, of course, Samantha was an anomaly amongst her kind. Either way, it would support her request to the Council, the Solar Confederation, humanity, could be a potential ally. At the very least, if what Samantha was saying was true, they are worth investigating. It just might be the start of something to finally end all the bloodshed. With a flick of an arm, another compartment opened. She removed the finery from her head, which delicately jingled as she stowed them away. She extracted a hollow visor and affixed the device to her head, prompting it to activate and project a heads-up display. Opal let out a weary sigh. With the interesting part over, it was time to write a report to the High Queens of the Commonwealth Council. With any luck, she'd be able to persuade them to support her rather unique endeavor. She could only hope that they were amendable to a coexistence with hind legs after all this time at war. End of chapter. Chapter 13. Interlude. Gunboat Diplomacy. Admiral Beckett sighed as he looked out the viewport. They were using his own weapons against him. The Third Frontier Fleet was forced to hang back from the planet Oyster and the Halkazar Fleet in orbit in front of the world. His fleet's main armaments, high-powered coil guns, would devastate the planet if they missed or penetrated the Halkazar ships. It would escalate the border skirmish into a full-blown war. Worse still, the Kalar Imperium and the Halkazar civilization could approach the USO for military aid, claiming that the humans committed war crimes. The fact that this just an outpost would almost certainly be left out of the report. Then, there was the fact that there were several soldier Confederate civilians imprisonment on the camp. The situation was beyond tenuous. He'd give anything to change it for the better. It began a few years ago. Pirate raids on human ships and colonies, patrol broats impounding ships on claims of smuggling, 
just as intergalactic trade began to take off. Constant posturing and bullying. The Kalar Imperium was trying to cow humanity into submission. Humanity was new to the galactic stage, but uh, unfortunately for them, far from new to space. Confederation colonies were not particularly numerous, but they were dense. Automated industries, advanced infrastructure, plentiful defensive installations, aggressive third parties were dealt with swiftly and with gusto. In fact, their actions had only improved humanity's sense of unity. The Halkazar wouldn't back down, however. Next came privateer actions and even minor fleet engagements. The situation kept escalating, more without drawing the ire of the USR. Humanity wouldn't complain, however. They were not a member yet. The Gala representatives were probably involved in delaying the Solar Confederation membership status. The Imperium had not declared war yet, thankfully. The exact reason was anyone's guess, but it was clear that the apprehensive about it militarily. Maybe it was humanity's wanted reputation as death wilders. Beckett wondered when that lie would fall through. Human cybernetics were well disguised, but many had already found out the humans used them. It was only a matter of time before they figured out the astonishing physical feats were only due to synthetic bits. His eye twitched as a new message was pinged directly into his brain. Beckett felt the cable of his neural jack in his neck strain ever so slightly as his head drooped down a little. Yet another demand from the Halkazar to leave, no mention of returning the captives. Beckett was given the authority to make important political decisions due to attempt, but as best he could, to not start an open war. They were not making this easy. Admiral, several have been detected near the gas giant Case 5. Unknown configurations, the ships behind reported. Becker turned away from the raining, the viewport screens deactivated, shrouding the room in a dull glow of orange lighting fixtures. Thank you, Makena, he replied as he turned to the command chair and the center of the ring of consoles in the secular room. The other two crewmates present remained quiet with their eyes closed, their minds sifting through fresh data delivered directly to the brains through their implants. We estimate the vessels are refueling their FTL drives. It is unknown how they arrived undetected. Cloaking technology is suspected. But then they'd have to have been sitting cloaked for nearly a week in the system. If that's the case, why show the hand now? Admiral, Commandant Lou piped up, his eyes opening from his digitally induced trance. Might be a bit of a long shot, but they could have used some kind of warpless FTL. It would explain how they just showed up without any tachyon burst signature. Unlikely, but possible. Uh, let's put that up on the back burner for now. Set the fleet to readiness level 3. Makina, do we have any visuals on the new ships? Yes, Admiral. Badging the feed now. The images flitted through Beckett's mind like the scenes of a vivid daydream. Emerald-colored vessels glittering in the dark. They were angular, spearheaded shaped, definitely not like the white wedge shapes of the Kalar Imperium used. Then there were the lead ship, a monstrous four-kilometer battleship, even the third frontier fleet's battlecruiser, the Heart of Ice, came a kilometer short of the behemoth. Then the ships started to assume a combat formation. Admiral, the Kalar ships are now on the move. Their estimated trajectory puts them in a defensive position facing the unidentified fleet. New orders, all crew to battle stations. Makina, order the fleet to stand by at combat readiness. Confirmed, all ships are assuming fleet readiness level 5. Admiral, our destroyers are picking up trace strange matter readings from unknown ships, he said, Lou said. Before he could respond, Beckett's attention was taken by a new message from the Halkazar. The entire communique flicked through his mind in a matter of many seconds. They were offering to return the human terrorists in exchange for assisting them in a fleet against the new enemy. There was even a mention of putting in a good word for the USO Security Council. Blue, any idea of the unknown ships? Beckett inquired. Sorry, sir, but no, there isn't anything on them that we can get in our databases. The USO databases, or even the offer from the Alcazar. Well, I'm not going to start a war with the unknown civilization for some... Admiral, Tachyon Type Beam from the Unidentified Battleship. Live audio request. What? Tachyon Type Beam from the... No, I... Whatever. Beckett sighed. Patch the audio to the bridge. Let's open up a dialogue. First contact. 
This was going to be interesting. He felt a small ping in the forefront of his mind that signaled that the link was active. Ah, we're through! A female voice came from the alien end. His eyebrows shot up. It sounded... human. Hello, humanity! It's been a while! The woman shouted into the comlink, causing Beckett to wince slightly. Who starts first contact like that? Hold on. Is that a human speaking? Whatever. Resolving a threat came first. Unidentified ships near Kai Spy. Please identify yourselves. Oh, crap, yeah, um... She started before another voice cut in. It was older, more refined, and had a faint synthetic mark of having been run through a translation software. You are currently speaking to Admiral Opal Kalani, High Queen of the Opal Brood. May I apologize for my associate's cross-language? There are warships of the Jack's Commonwealth. Who do I have the pleasure of speaking with today? That would be Admiral Jackson Beckett of the Solar Confederation. Why are you in this system? Funnily enough, my fleet is currently on a diplomatic mission to meet your people. We would just stop to top up our hydrogen supplies. A diplomatic mission? You are aware that this system is in a border of the Kalar Imperium, Admiral Kalani. It is not within Solar Confederation territory. Couldn't you have sent a runner ship instead of an expeditionary fleet? Unfortunately, that was not a viable option, Admiral Beckett. The Chax Commonwealth is in a state of war with the Kalar Imperium. That would explain the response from the Halkazar. This was not the scenario he hoped for earlier, but it was at least something. Okay then, out of interest, how did you learn about us? We certainly have no records about you. That would be due to the valiant actions of one of your people. Um, you can speak up again, dear. Th thanks, Opal. Uh, sorry for earlier. I, I, I didn't mean to swear, uh, um, sir, the human voice said. Your language is excused, he responded curtly, trying to absolute best to let his surprise show through his speech. Hello, uh, my, my name is Miss Samantha Poway. I am Mr. Jacob Poway's daughter, if that means anything. Officially, I am an Amber Samantha Poway, queen-elect of the Amber Brood and envoy to the Chax Commonwealth. Uh, I see. Uh, give me a moment, Beckett requested. His mic muted, he turned to face his commandant. Anything? Blue nods as he subconsciously filtered through the ship's databanks. Yep, Mr. Poway is our ambassador to the Zaneshi Order. He had a daughter called Samantha, missing, presumed dead, for 15 months following a pirate attack on a research vessel. Presumed dead. There is a chance, however slim, that she is the real deal. That'll have to be confirmed later. There was an armed standoff to handle. Beckett rubbed his weary eyes. A posturing empire. A new civilization appeared literally out of the black, apparently wanting to begin diplomatic talks. They seemed to like humans, at least if they were to be believed. Some genuine allies would be nice, and their intentions were noble, as they said. But the issue still stood. He needed the Kalar Imperium to stand down, and he needed his people back. If only he could run up and snatch them without having to fire a boo. Oh. With a wordless thought through his neural jack, Beck had reactivated the mic. Admiral Kalani would it be rude to ask how the war effort is on your end. You don't have a reason to believe me, but I'd say that it's going well. We have these hind legs on the run back home. We've started a new offensive, the alien declared proudly. You reckon that you could kill the Kalar fleet around Esther? Hmm? You want us to show my capabilities so soon? Take me on a date first, mister. Lou chuckled at that statement, receiving a withering gaze from Beckett in turn. Please answer seriously, Admiral Kalani, Beckett replied. Seven Halkazar ships are no match for my flagship, let alone my fleet of fifteen. The crews would be breathing vacuum before a minute had passed. Hmm. Well then, Opal, would you be interested in giving the hind legs a scare? You want me to find them? No, I want you to scare them. Look like you're ready to go in and start something. They have been giving us some barely disguised grief for a while now. This entire time we didn't know that they had been getting beat down. Are you starting to catch what I'm going with this? I think so, she replied impishly. What will you be doing then? I'll say hello, say I'm staying neutral, and hint that I know what's going on. I can feed you the audio directly, if you prefer. That sounds lovely, except the tight beam from the case three in a moment. The audio link then abruptly ended. Lou sat forward in his chair as he processed the new data readings. 
sir, strange matter levels have spiked and... We can no longer detect the Chax fleet, Admiral. Makina cut in. He hadn't expected that. Love, get thee! Make it stopped as a new sensor data fitted through his mind. The new type beam from Kais 3. And the Chax fleet. Hey, what? Well, no, I was right, Lou muttered. Instant point to point, Helmsman Santiago finally piped up after a minute of staying silent. She let out a low whistle and arched an eyebrow. I'd kill to get something like that in the heart of ice. Could you imagine the bullcrap maneuvers we'd be able to pull off? Quiet, people! Magina, tight beam, he ordered. Once again, the two-way tachyon communication network interfaced. Could you tell us that you were going to teleport beforehand? That was a bit new to us. I'm contacting the hulks now. You'll have ears and a gesture of goodwill. Some chittering sounds came from the chack side in the exchange. The response had no translation. Blue shuddered. Um, what have we made contact with? Face spiders? Lou asked. His words communicated through the neural jack to keep it private. The crew present did not acknowledge the comment. Beckett breathed deep. A live communication request was sent to the Halkazar command on the planet. After a few tense moments, it was accepted. Come to accept their proposal? The Halkazar commander, Trelek, asked. The tone of his voice was seeping with confidence. Beckett couldn't help but smile as the conversation began. He relished in the thought of being able to make these warmongers squirm. I'm still thinking over, Commander Trelek. It's an intriguing offer, to say the least, but uh, can you explain why you want us to attack them? Silence dominated the bridge for a precious number of seconds. The Kalar, the Imperium, and several other states are at war with the Chax monsters. They have despoiled a number of our worlds already. I would ask you to join our noble effort to drive them back to the pit from whence they came, as that is what is expected from you and any self-respecting upholder of peace in the galaxy at large. Hmm. That would be noble indeed, would it not? Beckett remarked. But why should I need to do so? Your people surely have it within your own power to destroy such, uh, evils by themselves, easily. We are merely a minor neutral power. Why risk our lives against such a powerful new foe? Beckett responded with a feigned seriousness. You would abandon us, Admiral, Trellick responded. Abandon, Commander. You asked us to leave, did you not? I had, but that scenario has changed. There is an enemy at our doorstep now. You do well to assist us. You need assistance? Beckett questioned. There was no immediate response from the Hunkazar. This war seems very unfortunate, does it not, Commander? Indeed, it is very unfortunate. Will you aid us, Admiral? Trellick said, the frustration now audible in his voice. At least you have only one monster against you. Any more would be disastrous. I digress, Commander. I believe my people would appreciate being back in my custody. And I think, uh, what did you call them again? Ah, yes, the, the Chucks. Situation is bad. If only something could be done of it. Will you assist us? Commander Trellick reiterated. We would, of course, aid our allies, Commander Trellick. Should you have our best intentions at heart, of course. Beckett not only subtly stated to two parties listening. Although, I must ask, did you wish for this war with the Jacks? Through his neural jack, Beckett sent a request for Opal to briefly send a single vessel to his fleet. Ah, of course not, Trellick replied. It is the mere consequence of ruthless Jack's identity that is a war has occurred. I think you have delayed enough. Will you aid us? Wordlessly, Beckett arranged the placement of his fleet leaving a gap in his formation. With a quick flash, the Chuck's cruiser appeared to fill the space. Beck had received a small notification, identifying the vessel as ardent. Aid can mean a lot of different things. I suppose you would easily prefer peace with such an aggressive civilization, if possible. Uh, correct. Admiral, you keep... Trella halted his speech as a new scanner data was relayed to him. Almost as soon as the Ardent appeared amongst his ranks, it disappeared again to rejoin the Chuck's fleet. Is something the matter, Commander? Whose side are you on, Hewan? Trellick yelled. 
I own, of course, Commander. If there is apparently an issue between our peoples, we could always resolve it with the groups of diplomats, if you wish. I would hate to see something so easily resolved with words ending gunfire. Blissful quiet consumed the breach of the heart of ice. Beckett reveled in the disquiet that he was stirring in the Halkazar counterpart. Oh, and by some miracle, if the Chaks would be open to peace talks, would you be open to them too? He could almost taste Trellick's fury at this point. I will send for the Imperial Senate, Admiral. If, if some miracle peace with such a disgusting soulless species as the Chaks is possible, my people would readily accept it. That is good to hear. I'll get my own people to collect my friend's planet side, and I'll send word to the Confederation leadership. Should I get some chack sized chairs arranged for the talks, just in case a miracle does happen? Beckett queried. Only a resigned sigh came from Beckett's Halkazar counterpart. Your actions have implications, Admiral. How will the USO Council see this? As humanity brokering peace, was Beckett's curt reply. Not a bolt of plasma was fired, although there was always a chance I have misremembered. Have our people shot at each other before? No, of course not, Dreddick said. Beck could easily hear him grinding his teeth together as he said those words. Anyway, Commander, I will see you at the table, along with the Chak's representative, he joked. Dreddick cut the communication. Well, then, that's that. Was that suitable, Opal? Reckard asked. The venerable queen responded with a chirp of affirmation. More than I could have done. The last time the hind legs deigned to speak with us was one hundred years ago. You have my sincerest gratitude for aiding us. And you have mine for being just what I needed to win this decade-long pissing match. So, um... Beckett clapped his hands together. Official business, then. I'll get some ambassadors ready to meet yours. Would you mind sending us some data, giving us basic rundown of who and what your people are? I'll put one together for you, too. Done, Opal said, as she sent a pre-prepared first contact package, co-written by a certain Miss Bowie. I will have Sartle prepared so that we can continue this conversation in person. I will see you later, Admiral Beckard. And you, too, High Queen Opal Kaladi. I wish to see Miss Bowie join us, too, if that's not too much trouble. Only if I can bring Bite here along, Samantha declared, interrupting the ongoing dialogue. Any self-respecting queen would. Why are you looking at me like that? I said you're... I called you but I didn't, I swear. Beckett's brow furrowed as he tried to understand who Samantha was talking to. Who's, uh, Bitey? The comm channel then immediately seemed to erupt into a loud clicking, chirping, and yelling. Empress, damn it! Samantha, you promised, I swear on my oath, if I'm called bitey on official documents, I'll drag you back to Yellow Red and put you back in the bloody comm station I found you in! End of chapter. Numerous clicks, beeps, and hisses echoed through the hall. Almost every major news agency in the galactic arm had gotten someone through the door ready to launch interviews and take pictures. It isn't every day that two galactic powers signed a white piece, let alone with the infamously monstrous Chax. But that particular set of accords had already been done an hour earlier. It was currently the official signing of the Solar Kalar Corporation Accords. The room where this particular treaty was being signed was little too small for the queen like Opal to fit. Samantha had been assigned to act as a representative, to the chagrin of the Confederation Diplomatic Corps. And with her, of course, came her attendant, too. Hushed whispers were effortlessly silenced by the single sweep of Bitey's baleful glaze. Even though the knowledge that peace was possible with the Chaks had spread like wildfire, instincts were instincts. The reporters and cameramen all shrunk away a few paces at the passing glance. Most of the hind legs still feared him. Only... Most of them, at least. He took secret satisfaction in being able to instill such feelings so easily. Bitey turned his head to the side slightly to glimpse the national leaders of the humans and the Halkazar shaking hands. Both the President of the Solar Confederation and the Chancellor of the Kalar Imperium parted with warm smiles on their faces. Bitey, of course, could tell that they were only skin deep. There were a lot of feelings wafting in the air. So many biological molecules... He hadn't been an enclosed space with so many hind legs since... 
I, uh, uh, <clears throat> Sarkis? Uh, Sarkis? Samantha whispered. Mm, yes. He spaced out there for a, for a moment. Everyone is leaving. Sarkis swiveled his head to see the officials walking off the race platform. The human off to his right and the Halkazar to his left. With another adjustment of his head, he watched the reporters file out of the double doors at the far end of the hall. I apologize. Lead the way, he replied, following his charge through the doorway and into the adjoining hallway. The Junk's warrior could just about fit anywhere in the building, with a bit of trouble regarding doorways. Nothing mighty hadn't encountered in the tunnels of his colony, thankfully. Squeezing through the tight passageways was almost nostalgic in a strange sort of way. That looks like a tight fit if I've ever seen one. The President Byron mused, stopping a moment to focus her attention on the sight. It's like watching mittens squeeze through a cat flap. He responded to the dark-skinned human's comment with a small huff, with his full form entered the hallway. I'd like to thank you, Sarkis. It's due to your actions that got our girl back home in one piece. The thank should be with Miss Bowie. She's uh, he faltered as Sam gave him an imploring look. I was merely doing what was expected of me. It was no problem. She responded with a small smile and a nod. This time, it was far more genuine. They continued to walk down the moderately winding hallway. Admittedly, I am a bit spotty on the events that transpired on Yellow Red. Run into any issues during that time? Baron asked. A few, uh, some confrontations. Most were resolved diplomatically. Uh, we found a survivor. She passed due to previously sustained injuries, was Bitey's toast response. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, come on, Bitey. That was a field report, not a story of daring survival. You even forgot to mention bubbles, Sam complained. Sarkis' head snapped to glare at Samantha. Sam! That one had to be intentional, she shrugged. I'm sorry, it just slipped out. Sarkis couldn't tell if she was lying this time. Stupid cleansers, stupid human body language, stupid human nicknames. So, mighty, Miss Baron started nonchalantly, eliciting a strange sigh from the Chax warrior. But it's a story with bubbles. We managed to capture a hostile Yali going by the name of Jask. Bubbles was what Samantha named for it. Samantha continued for him. Yeah, we chatted a little. He left with the pirates and nearly nabbed us before the Chax showed up. Bubbles was a bit of standoffish, but he ended up being all right. All right, Sarkis coughed. Jask tried to send you off to the pirates at gunpoint. He didn't mean it. J Bubbles just, just had a troubled past. Uh, it, it's, it's what he, he thought he needed to do. That still doesn't make it right. I shouldn't have let him go. Everything worked out fine. It was the right call. Uh, my judgment was definitely... Definitely correct, Samantha cut him off. When you have made a decision that has been detrimental in the long run. Bitey motioned to speak, but couldn't find an adequate counter. Not fighting harder to have a better nickname, he eventually grumbled. Oh, that's not how it works, Burian tittered. You probably only made it stick harder. After another set of doors and a bit more squeezing on Bitey's part, the trio and the additional complement of solar marines emerged in the private large hangar of the Kalari administrative complex. The cool grey white metal of the facility was offset by the imperial crimson banners, which littered the walls and were further contrasted by the deep green of the Chax transport ship taking up most of the free space. Smaller, less opal-sized shuttles remained landing in tight clumps to the side. Bidey could sense the disdain lingering amongst the engineers. It was probably something about having less space for their ships. Good old xenophobia was also always a good bet. Underneath Opal's transport was the Opal itself, casually talking to Admiral Beckett in his dress blues. Opal's wear was a standard replendant clothing that had ornate metal devices attached to both her back and mouth parts. A recent human invention since first contact occurred with the Chax four months prior. With these new translators, dreaded Chax chatter headaches were no more. Opal turned to greet the group as she noticed their approach. Ah, Madam President... Queen Amber, I see that you've returned. How was the treaty signing? She asked, focusing attention on Sam. No issues, lots of happy faces and hopeful words, she replied with a smile that didn't quite reach her eyes. As I'd expect. Madam President, it is a pleasure to meet you again. 
but I must take my leave. I have to return back to the rest of my brood at some point. Opal said as she shifted her attention to the other human of authority before her. Beckett, thank you very much for informing me about the change in the Yili situation. I'll have something iron out by next month when I come back to you on the Fold Gates proposal. I'll see you then, Noble. Madam President, uh, this way, please. The Admiral guided her with an outstretched hand to the large macrae human shuttle adjacent to the Chuck's craft. President Bayron nodded and started making her way across the hangar to the ship with the bodyguards in tow. To Sarkis's confusion, Samantha went with them too. Hold on, Samantha. Um, uh, where are you going? What do you mean? Oh, oh, did I forget to tell you? Sarkis shifted his weight slightly. Forget to tell me what? He asked wearily. Is something the matter? Bayron inquired. Give me a minute. Uh, I'll be on the shuttle shortly. Samantha said, attempting to placate her worry. Bayron nodded and gestured for her guards to continue onwards with her. Well, uh, well, I, I should have told you sooner, Bitey. She began sheepishly scratching at the back of her head. Bitey's mind began to race. What does that gesture mean? Damn it! He can't read her intentions properly. Did you forget to pack your things, Samantha? Opal chimed in as she trotted up to the pair. No, I, um, uh, forgot to tell him. Uh, sorry. Samantha, I have count of our representative forgetting to tell her aides about her departure. He has no time to mentally prepare. Did you seriously forget to pack your things too? P pack uh, your, your departure. S Sam, uh, are you? Bitey's eyes lost focus as he started putting the pieces together. I didn't forget to pack, Opal. I transferred our things over to the FSN clearing call earlier this morning, she declared. It was then Bidey started gathering his words. He couldn't just let Samantha leave as suddenly as they met. It was his charge. He couldn't, wouldn't leave her. Sam, can't just stand by and watch you dis- Al? His protest faltered halfway through being spoken. Yeah, our things, Samantha affirmed. You are coming with me, obviously. We're going to go on a small tour around the SC colonies. No, but, he replied as a wave of relief washed over him. Then he realized what is meant as Samantha said her goodbyes to Opal for the time being. Wait, I'm going to be around a lot more humans. Hold on. Uh, how long will this be? Four months. Come on, Sarkis, we can't leave them waiting. Sam yelled back at him as she started jogging towards the human shuttle. Um, what? Uh, he growled in frustration as he trailed after her. Some forewarning would have been nice. Did you even hear my conversation with Opal? She asked as she reached the side door of the airline at transport size. Oh, uh, also, you'll need to get in the back there with, with the marines. There's not enough room for you in the front. Mighty slowed his walking pace to a crawl. The back, he said as he looked at the loading ramp at the rear where a few soldiers were climbing into. He'd fit easily enough, but it wasn't exactly comfortably sized for a Chax warrior like himself. Oh, for the love of... Samantha let out a contented sigh as she relaxed into the luxury seats of the first-class section of the shuttle. Oh, that's good stuff. You'd be surprised at how difficult it is to get a hold of a good human-compatible chair in Jack's territory. What? Opal couldn't get you anything nice, Baron asked. Jacks don't really do chairs, and I'm no expert in upholstery, Samantha said, shuffling in her chair a little more as the shuttle began to take off. Speaking of Opal, um, what were you talking about, Admiral? Some potential solutions to Jack's holding colony situation. Getting the Yili on side by speaking their language and a dash of theoretical technology discussion. Artificial wormholes. Damn, ah, that sounds fun. A lot of the USO races will be slavering to cut the travel times of their trade routes by that much. Definitely. Something like that should make everyone want to get real chummy with us and the Jacks. It'll be a good step to clear the bad air around the jacks. But b before that, uh, we have to endear our own people to him. How's the face of Jack's Commonwealth going to fare in the back? Beckett asked. He's explicitly stated that Sarkis doesn't want to be known as Bitey in any official documents. So I'd refer to him as Sarkis, if not to be rude, she requested, winking heavily at the end. Anyway, I'm sure he's fine. It'll be nice to change of pace to talk to friendly non-soldiers, I bet he's having a blast. Mighty stood in perfect silence. 
He held himself in a place of grabbing hold of the cargo rigging on the ceiling with his now long since regenerated arm. They were just staring at him, unnervingly. Twenty marines sitting across the hull either side of him, unsure of how to react. Sarkis could smell the wariness and a hint of amusement in the air. Whenever. He would stay quiet and they won't bother him. At least the silence was better than Samantha's jeering. A small silver lining, especially as they were not aware of his nickname. A few of the soldiers started to smell a little different. Their emotions were shifting wildly. Samantha had never done that unless she was... Right. They were all likely using implants to communicate. Still, with so many subtly shifting emotions so frequently, it was getting difficult to get a read on them. Once again, humans around him were able to hide their thoughts from him. Sarkis clacked his mandibles in frustration. The soldiers jumped at the sound. Well, uh, at least they've stopped talking for a second, he thought. Hey, what's with that snap? A soldier with his right piped up. What? Sarkis said. You know what you just did? Some kind of twitch, or was it something else? I, uh, I suppose it's some sort of twitch. Ah, the man responded, scratching the stubble at his chin. Anything making you feel twitchy, then? Nothing. No, he lied. Mm-hmm. Just a bit twitchy. Just a bit twitchy, I suppose. They all returned to the awkward moment from a few moments ago. Once again, the soldier's emotion shifted as they resumed their small... Hey, twitchy! What are the Jack's ladies like? He asked with a grin on his face. I am Sarkis, not twitchy, but to answer your question, Jack's won't have two forms. Drones, much like me, but are far closer to your size. The queens are larger, being twice my size, he replied. The marine nodded sagely at the response. Hey, Raker, the Jack's girls are just like him. Right up your alley, he jeered out loud. Feck you, spades. I'm not screwing an antar. Oh, Riker, another soldier hollered from across the room. If you'd bang a chucker, then you're not one to talk, Harkness. Riker spat back with his own grin. It's the pot calling the battle black. What are you even talking about? Sarkis interrupted. Shut it, lads, an older marine at the back end of the shuttle commanded, instantly hashing the others. Sarkis let out a sigh of relief. Thank the Empress, that's over. He silently thanked the higher-ranked soldier. You're confusing, Twitchy, the older soldier said with a grin. Twitchy groaned inwardly with most of the men around him started chuckling. I hate humans. End of chapter. Chapter 15. Epilogue. A change of scenery. Dutch cried out of frustration as he lost yet another round to the Corlick Parker. The Yili's scaled fist slammed into the table, causing chips to fly about and fermented drinks to slosh around in half-empty glasses. Damn it, Gran! Those can only be so rocky! I'll guess you this round! He drunkenly declared. Yes, boss, of course, Cran assured him as he raked in the winnings for his fourth consecutive round. A few other aliens at the table groaned and complained, but put forward the chips for another hand. One of them, spilling what was left of his Gekna spirit on himself. Cran concealed his smile behind his small sip of water. Now lose one of these days. Err, um, Dutch replied with his toothy maw. Yes! Jask flinched, turning to face his uncle from the table opposite him. Yeah? Dutch wiggled his now empty glass and held it out to him. Jask grunted, standing up and taking the glass and the accompanying keycard. Fine, I'll get you more beer. The Yuli marched off towards the other end of the crowded canteen to the bar. He slanted the keycard into a small aperture next to a series of dispensers plugging in the codes for a beer on the captain's tab. After a moment of thought, he put in a request for a second beverage and charged it to his account. Sighing, Jask rubbed his head, waiting for the drinks to be dispensed. The background noise and the vid screen on the wall, covered up by the boisterous laughter or heated arguments between the crew members present. Hey -o, little scales, uh, how's your day been? A gravelly voice came to his side's head. A bit crap, not gonna lie. I've been stacking crates all bloody day, he said, turning to face the red scale Draktar beside him. And just about every other day for the past eight months. You, Vash? All right, I guess. Um, been laying in about boarding party lads and sparring mats. 
None of them can put up a life fight for longer than a few seconds. It's not really that fun. Vash angled his eye on his head to look at the vid screen. Everything interesting on there? The dispensers let out a small ding as the glasses were finally filled with alcohol. Jazz picked up the drinks and turned his head to look at the vid screen. Nah, just some news about the Hell Eyes making a treaty with the... The humans, he said. Images of the small segments of video flicked by. Some displaying national speakers shaking hands and papers being signed. You have a heard of a human? Let's have a look, said Mash, fishing a nose plug looking device out of his vest pocket at his vest. The images and the accompanying text shifted, displaying the signing of an earlier treaty between the Chaks and the Halkasar. Ha! Huh, the war's actually over. Yes, Samantha got a little wish fulfilled, Jask muttered while taking a drink of his beer. It was then that the news feed switched back to displaying the solar cow, accords being signed, with Samantha and Bitey visible in the wide shot of the room. Caught in a moment of surprise, Jask accidentally inhaled some of his drink. <coughs> what the fuck? He managed to wheeze out. Vesh paused for a moment, more than a little confused as to why the Yili had choked on his own drink so suddenly. The Draktor shrugged and put the device under the end of his snout. With a small series of clinks, it unfurled to cover his heat-sensitive pits. He finally turned his head to face the screen. Now, able to see the visible light as it was translated to infrared, as Jask cleared the last of the alcohol from his simple respiratory airways. Ah! By my ancestors, it's him! Vash shouted, slamming both of his fists into a nearby table with enough force to cut through the prodigious din of the... Oh, and that weird girly. The canteen goes silent for a moment as the attention to Vass and Jask, who both awkwardly apologize for the disruption. Hold on, you know them, Jask quietly asked the large hunter. Yeah, kind of, um, that... Oh, he started, waiting for the program to show Ah, oh, That magnificent bastard! He pointed at Bitey on the screen. He owes me a jewel. The warrior even formally agreed to it. My family hasn't had an alien give such an honor in a while. You were on that planet for half an hour. How the hell did you meet Bitey and get him to swear to a jewel? The girl, he arranged it. Samantha arranged a death match. Yeah, she made sense. Uh, getting a one-armed fighter wasn't right, he answered. With all the political gents like that, no wonder she's a queen now. Wait, is what now? Jask muttered. A provisional queen. Elected positions for the bugs. She's got a sash in everything. Jask, more than a little fabergasted, tried to speak, but was silenced as Smash raised one of his hands to stop him. Before you ask how I know that, a good fighter has to know his quarry. Jacks are good sports, so it's only fair that I learn about them. That's, uh... Fair, I guess, Jask muttered, bringing his glass up to take a second attempt at drink. Typical lucky Sam, he thought to himself. So then, Jask, how do you know their names? Jask choked on his drink for the second time within a minute. Vesh laughed at the display, slapping the amphibious alien in the back tightly. Ah, oh, don't worry, don't worry, I'm just messing with you. I already know the truth, more or less. You got high crap when you've got a nose like mine. At least not with the way you retell your tale of survival. Yeah, yeah, whatever. What do you want? Jas demanded, having cleared his throat much quicker this time. Hmm, nothing, mate. He's answered frankly. Although I'd like to find the fight bitey again. Oh, and the news says his name's Sargus now, sir. He must have got knighted. Well, uh, good for you. If you don't mind, I have, uh... A beer too. Jazz grumped and quickly trailed off. A messy pa, a drunken uncle for his boss. More crates and stacks day after day after day. Once again, he had no plan aside from just making it to the next day. Damn it, this job had not changed anything in his life. Why hadn't he noticed sooner? He needed something new. Something new. You're right, mate. Besh asked with a frozen yuli before him. Without warning, Jask chugged the beer in a matter of moments, slamming the empty glass on the table. Inhaled deeply and exhaled sharply. Can I come with you to find Bitey and Samantha? Hmm, yeah, sure, why not? Uh, the more the barrier, but um, if you don't mind me asking, why? Jask let out a heavy sigh and shrugged. 
I don't know. I guess I just need a change of pace. Maybe a new story to tell. Besides, you'll probably roll up to some kind of Chax embassy and get torn to shreds with your attitude. I can't just let that happen to you, he replied. Oh, you some kind of expert in getting buddy-buddy with the bugs, Besh joked. Not exactly, but I got some good advice from what just might be the leading Chax USO relations expert. Bash took a moment to scent the air with his preternatural sense and engaged the truth in Jask's statement. To his interest, Jask was telling the truth. All right, then. What do you need to do to get on that side? Give him a belly rub. Feed him some poor, unfortunate soul. Jask snorted in amusement. Nah, nothing like that. Jask dismissed the claim. Vesh told that he said to cast an imploring look at the Yili, a rather strange expression for someone without the eyes. Jask smiled as he recalled some of the first awkward words spoken to him by a good friend. Just, um, ask nicely. They change your pace. Cavernous, imposing, dimly lit. Even Opal seems small in the hall as large as this. Intricately carved stone pillars displaying generations of history. The walls, far away and dark as they were, displayed magnificent frescoes depicting the numerous Commonwealth empresses and their councils dating back to the years of the Unification Wars. As depicted time went by across the walls, the number of queens rose from just the first empress to a handful of queens to the full complement of twelve. A few paintings had the council seats in minuscule walkers. The events that led to that weren't particularly difficult to figure out. Now we certain this is the right thing to do. High Queen Jasper Dalbren, sixth seat, voiced her concern. It's barely been a year, and we're already considering letting hind legs roam around in our own territory as they were on our own. I can't be the only one who sees the inherent danger in this. Her bronze-colored head flicked from side to side, observing the rainbow colors of the queens around her. The High Queens, seated around the circular table, muttered amongst each other as Opal waited patiently in the empty center. A vibrant blue-colored Jax with feathery girl extensions on her back waved a hand dismissively. Having humans empty out our holding colonies is reducing a potential danger more so than inviting a new one. It speed up living space and solves a moral crisis of detaining the hind legs simultaneously. A few contacts have already informed me that Srellis B6 has been emptied and its population have found effective employment on human worlds. Jade Whalen, fourth seat, bobbed her head in agreement. The Jade Brood has been given an unprecedented opportunity to expand our farming operations with freeing of Skrellis B6. Our projections see us recovering from the population lost in the war within four years. The humans are a boon to the Commonwealth. They are a threat, Amethyst Balvick declared. My agents just last week have discovered that the humans are in talks with the Yili. The humans are... Enough, please! The Black Jacks at the head of the table commanded. The queens at the table stopped muttering. I apologize, Empress. I was merely concerned for the sake. I am aware of your intentions, Amethyst, but our policy regarding humans has already been discussed. As for the Yili, it is the reason this moot was actually called. Opal, do you mind explaining what this is all about? Eleven insectoid heads shifted to focus on the pale queen at the center. No, of course, my Empress. Opal swept her hand forward to interface with a hollow visor, sending file over to the vid screens in front of the High Queen's present. Ladies, the humans are buying out the Yili. A deafening silence fell over the room as they read through the document. There are... Uh, what? Sapphire asked, voicing the thoughts of the other chacks around her. How are the humans going to purchase their way into making them friendly? They're trading their workers, Opal answered. Quiet again. Opal loved hearing the prissy monarchs mutter their concerns. Jasper leaned in. Now allies are buying slaves, she inquired. Yes and no. It's been dubbed the Souls for Steel initiative by their president. The humans are trading their AI piloted factory robots for the Yili slaves. The machines, of course, are far more efficient than the people the Yili use and are something only the humans can produce and are willing to sell. I think I know where this is going, the red-hued queen chimed in. Various Yili companies are fighting to get their hands on the new merchandise and to deprive their competitors of superior workers. 
This, in turn, is probably causing said deprived companies to play whatever cards they can to garner the human's favor in priority shipments, which would then start causing competition of some kind, which would then escalate to... Ruby Gabriel reasoned. Oh, I. Their entire society might be in turmoil. It... it couldn't have been that easy. Right? Opal merely chittered in amusement at that statement. I'm afraid to say that it was, Ruby. A few years' investment and advancing machine intelligence and an open diplomatic channel is all that would have taken to cripple one of our oldest foes. I suppose we didn't exactly have either at hand, Ruby Gabriel mused. So then, when can we expect this peace treaty? She half-joked. A few weeks, according to my contact in the Solar Confederacy, Opal curtly replied. A couple queens snickered at the ridiculousness of it all. The rest remained stunned. Silence. And uh, the souls part of the initiative? Amethyst asked. What happens to them? About a concern, said Opal. The humans give them new IDs, run them through the bureaucracy of their citizenship program, and put them down as suitable planets. It is the same thing that they do with the POWs in our holding colonies. Actually, I wanted to ask about that, the Empress said. Of what benefit does taking the hind legs off of us benefit the humans? Oh, galactic politics, mostly. Opal addressed her only true superior. It helps with their appeal to join the USA and have so many different species coexisting within their borders. Outside of that, it's additional hands and new perspectives. At least, that's what I've been told. I'm grateful to be able to report that we have nothing to indicate that this is not the case, too. The Empress nods and preens the sensory spines on the back of her head contemplatively. So our allies have made a business deal, and that's beneficial to everyone. I don't think what's happening to the Yuli can be considered beneficial in their eyes, Opal suggested. Perhaps not in the short term, but I can imagine there's a lot of happy shareholders in dice right now. The worst of their civilization are also probably actively culling themselves as we speak. People trafficking suddenly went from a very profitable to unsustainable. If that isn't beneficial, I don't know what is. Multiple words of agreement came from the council around Opal. Well, if that is resolved, are there any other matters that need to be brought up, Opal? Yes, actually, she said, gesturing again to send the second document. Opal expected this particular idea to be a shock, but the sheer silence, for a minute no less, was more than she expected. You can't be serious, Amethyst said. You've gone mad. The years have finally gotten to you. Rude, Opal remarked. Maybe it's the human. Higher brain schemes seem to be their forte, Sapphire reasoned. It's not a maybe. Queen Amber is the authority of this document. The Empress corrected. And this is a bit much from you, even considering your record. Doing this could antagonize the entire USO, Opal, not just the nations on our borders. With all due respect, Empress, it's far from one of the most radical positions put forward by the Council within the past year. We would have the humans, Hagazar, and now the Yili backing us. I'd say it stands to reason that it is the next step considering the series of events so far. I suppose so, the Empress sighed. It just feels, um, very wrong. Even if it is the right thing to do, does anyone object to the proposal made by Amber Poe and put forward by Opal Kalani? She cast her gaze at the royalty at the table, finding no shaking heads or words of dismissal. Okay, then. We will need a representative for this mission. Do you have any suggestions? Opal stepped forward. A might I- No! Everyone in the queen present more or less yelled at her. Don't even try it. Not after what she did the last time she appeared here, the empress groaned. Queen Amber would be the very last person that we would send. A change of heart. Grand Unit 2. Do you have any idea when Miss Naan and Tony will arrive? A little grey alien asked, wrapping his fingers against the table he was sitting behind. The circular chrome inlay on his ceiling pulsed with lines of blue light as the ancient AI acknowledged the question. The white circle in the blue orb that was the ocular sensor shifted to focus on the Chancellor of the USO Senate. A disembodied voice replied, deep, cold, and mechanical. Yes, Chancellor, there are approaching this room from the adjoining hallway as we speak. Estimated arrival time, one minute. 
Danex did not bother with the response. G Unit 2 was a machine. Its purpose was to serve the Zaneshi Order. Although there was a point to be made that it was the Zaneshi Sentinels that ran the USO, not the Order. Perhaps the Order was an accessory to the Sentinels and not the other way around. Whatever, it didn't matter about manners. Why should he? He peered down from his position at the central desk four rows up from the floor, the so-called throne the others had taken to calling it. Disrespectful younger races, each would struggle to achieve a mere century of life. Gensix could easily live another three to comfortably retire at his eighth. Okay, easily he was probably a Muslima. Single century old Zaneshi tend to be reckless with how they spend their years, which was what the Sentinels were built for. To keep the Zaneshi safe with mixed results. Millennia of experience still couldn't anticipate juvenile stupidity. His eyes splitted from one side of the semicircular chamber to another. Every representative aside from the human was present. The Erba were talking with the Yuli. The Dactra representative was remaining stoic as usual. The Chakra, the Yejum, the Sacrum were having a chat in their own corner. Minister Trest and the Kalor Imperium was, uh, twitching. Minister, are you all right? Jensix called out to Nikolari to get his attention. The Alcazar did not respond, instead continuing to nod his head. Was he having a seizure? Minister Trust! The middle-aged man jumped, frantically fishing his earbuds out of his auditory organs. Y- y- yes, Chancellor? Good. He wasn't having a medical emergency. N- you were, um... Jensix waved a hand, trying to get the right words. Bobbing. Are you fine? Yes, Chancellor, just fine, quite, quite fine, very fine, he blabbed out. Genzex narrowed his eyes. Have you taken a controlled substance? Oh, no, 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 Chancellor, I have not. I just, it was just music. I am sorry. Music, what is Chancellor Genzex? Grand Unit 2 interrupted. The human. Genzex immediately straightened his posture to glower down at the new arrival. It appeared to be a well-dressed human male. Disturbingly, he appeared to have some kind of prosthetic arm that he had made no attempt at hiding. The cold metal of his right hand was open to the air for all to see. Jensix pulled his eye away from the thing to focus on the human as a whole. Ah, Minister Anatoly, it is a pleasure to see you at last. He greeted the man from across the room. It is a pleasure to see you too, Chancellor. Anatoly replied with a curt nod and a warm smile. If it isn't too much of a deposition, I've brought a plus one for a matter that I'd like to bring up today. She'll be here near the end of today's Congress. So long as her presence is relevant. Attention! Jensix called out to the floor, garnering looks from all the representatives of the USO. Before we begin today's proceedings, I think it prudent that we congratulate Minister Anatoly on his election to represent the Solar Confederation, and by extension humanity on the United Species Organization Senate as its 28th member. There was a small round of applause from the representatives, drawing out a bashful smile from the human as he took his seat. Let us begin the proceedings, Minister Kellek. If I remember correctly from last month, you wanted to propose a new bill to... The fifth proceeding will now be considered resolved. Moving into the sixth and final proceeding, Mr. Anatoly, you have the floor. Jensix was about done with all the contrived nonsense. If the other races just handed over their administrative work to an AI system and the Sentinels, he wouldn't have to waste hours of his life in a frankly pointless Senate. But it was what the Sentinels suggested, so it was what it was. It still didn't make it any less soul-sucking. Grand Unit 2, do you know who the human's attaché is? Jensix whispered to the holopad. A small text box appeared in the corner of the screen function, and the GU-2's private method of reply. The name listed is as Ruby. That's it, yes, Chancellor. Genzex shot the AI a ceiling with a disbelieving look. He'd known grand units to be able to skim through data nets and developing civilizations in seconds. GU-3 alone had access to cameras of the Chakra as they made it to the stars and had obtained classified data from the top militaries without alerting them in the slightest. How? GU-4 was responsible for monitoring humanity's progress in the past 300 years. Now a grand unit was telling him all they had was a name. 
The AI remains steadfast, any simple response, which only calls Genzex to stare down the eye at the ceiling. Are you withholding information for the safety of the Order? Yes, appeared on the screen of his holopad. Genzex's eyes flicked to the human as they made their way to the speaker's podium. Am I privy to an answer? Yes. When is the danger? The humans requested that we keep Ruby a surprise, for the sake of improving diplomatic relations, and because Ruby was deemed a non-threat, this was deemed acceptable. Now Genzex was confused. It was then that Minister Anatoly spoke. Ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, for the Solar Confederations, first to the United Species Organization Senate, we would like to put forward an application for a new member species. Wait, what? I know, I know, a new species so soon. Who are they? What are their beliefs? Do not worry, humanity can vouch for them. In fact, the vast majority of the people present should be very familiar with them by this point. Ruby, you may enter now. The muttering in the room fell to an absolute silence as they beheld the being that came through the doors. It marched in on four double-jointed legs. Fine silken ochre robes were draped over its deep red carapace. Two sets of arms lay folded over the being's chest, each wrist resplendent in dangling fine jewels. On its back and mandibles it wore a set of pearlescent devices to translate its speech. Then there was the size of the being. He could almost see eye to eye with Genzix on his desk on the top of the fourth row. He wanted to scream, to shout, to declare that this gave rave insults to the entire Senate, to bring a creature so viscerally unsettling before them. However well dressed, it was akin to goading a chainsaw in glitter. But his mind stayed his mouth. His eyes traced over his stunned compatriots and very quickly spotted some notable outliers. First, it was the Yili. The three gentlemen that represented them had nothing but barely concealed grins on their faces. Not too surprising, all things considered. They had been utterly fleecing the humans until they turned the entire trade situation on its head. A few power plays could have easily seen human suck-ups getting into power. Next was the Halklazar. Minister Trest had resigned grimace across his face. The man definitely didn't like the Chaks being here, but had to tolerate it nonetheless. Some political maneuvering was most likely at play there, too. Gunboat diplomacy, he reckoned. However, the most concerning anomaly was none of the people below him. Genzex glanced up at Gurian Unit, too, who was merely observing the motion in complete silence. Not reacting at all, letting the Jacks appear before the Senate. Genzex was there that fateful day 200 years ago the day the Sentinels had appeared before the Zaneshi Order with the Species Development Report. Grand Unit 2's report. It was short, concise. There was no room for interpretation. They had determined that the Chaks were an existential threat to the Zaneshi species. They needed to be eradicated. No amount of discussion could extract the reason as to why they wanted them gone. Sure, their bodies were the stuff of nightmares, but much like a surgeon being exposed to gore, they could ignore it with time. Termination was unheard of. Immoral. But what the Sentinels suggested was what must be done, for they are the guardians of the Order. Their plans are our will, and our will is reality. The pieces were put in place. The tides of fate were manipulated. First contact was intentionally set up as a bloodbath. The rest was up to the chosen players, the Hankosa and the Yili being the perfect vectors to bring about the demise of the Chaks, unknowing pawns in a greater game. But now Grand Unit 2 had apparently changed its mind. Gen 6 would have expected the machine to destroy the Chaks the moment it set foot in the building. Instead, here a Chaks was, standing side by side with another freak of nature, a much smaller freak of nature, beaming with a wide smile. If it wasn't the Chaks as a species they wanted dead, why did they declare extermination to begin with? Something had changed. <laughs> they can't join. They're at war with the members of the Senate, the Yijim screeched. No, Jensex reluctantly corrected, silencing the room again. The Jack's Commonwealth are no longer at war with any member of the USO. 
their political relationship with the Solar Confederation and the treaties established with the Kalar Imperium are evidence for them being capable of coexistence, albeit only being a mere two years so far, he said. His eyes met those of the Chax Queen ahead of him. The six beady eyes stared into the dark voids of his own. Ruby bowed politely, acknowledging Genzek's support for her. He looked at Grand Unit 2 one more time. Its eye was focused on him, still as a frozen lake. Genzek's eyes flicked to his hollow pad. Nothing. The machine would not share his rationale. The Zaneshi let out a deep sigh, returning his gaze to the Jacks ahead of him. <sighs> the Jacks Commonwealth will be considered for membership within the USO. We will proceed with vetting of their civilization unless this order will be refuted by a vote of two-thirds majority against the decision. Those against the order, raise your limbs now. He scanned the room for a final time that day, finding only three raised hands. Not even the Draktor voted against it. I guess we're going to be friends with the Chaks now, Jensix thought. A brood of two. Samantha! No response. Samantha! She rolled onto her side. Bitey huffed and looked around for a solution to the current predicament. He reached a claw into the rather spacious bedroom that had a door a tad too small for the chacks to put through. A hollow ding echoed through the room. Oh, hey! She exclaimed, shooting up from her bed and rubbing the back of her now sore head as her eyes tracked an empty beer can rolling along the floor. Did you just throw that at me? Yes! Bitey deadpan back. Vocalizations did not raise you from your sleep. Her hand shifted to rubber forehead instead. Vocalize quieter, have a killer headache. Her train of thought ended as the beer that came to a standstill amongst a pile of a few dozen others. Well, uh, that explains it. With great mental effort, Sam groggily shuffled out of bed. Good morning, mighty. It is the afternoon, he replied. Oh. The human took a moment to look around the room. The drawers were fine. There weren't any clothes scattered on the floor. Items were still on shelves, although a few were in more pieces than she remembered. There was a speaker lying on the side in the corner. Her waste bin had even more beer can stacked in it and an empty bottle of spirits. So, um, what did I do last night? You do not remember. I remember meeting up with some friends and then, uh, yeah, that, that, that's where it cuts off. They told me that might happen, Bitey sighed. We went to the multi-species bar to catch up with your friends from university. Jasmine suggested shots. Things escalated from there. Yeah, okay, keep going. When Abigail fell out of a chair, I suggested we stop. Your clack refused. We reached a compromise with you heading home to continue your escapades. A few reporters attempted to intercept you on the monorail there, but I managed to shoo them away. When we reached the house, which is where we are right now, in case your memory is that fuzzy, your clack started to settle down. That is when Dylan showed up with a beer. He gestured to the stack of cans on the floor. Ah, right, uh, I think I can faintly remember that. Uh, did he? No. Did I? No! He left with James before he became inebriated. Good, Samantha thought. I didn't mess that up. I also believe he, um, left with James, considering the chemicals they were both giving off. Mighty continued. God damn it, why is it always the hot ones? Anything else? You played that music thing, dancing around, broke some material in your room, tried to get me to eat some footwear that smelt like brackish mushrooms, then passed out. Your clack sobered up about an hour afterwards and cleaned up your mess, he finished. Um, sorry I had to put you through all of that. Sam apologized, rubbing the back of her head sheepishly. It's part of the job, Bitey said, moving out of the way of Sam as she stumbled out of the room and into the hallway. What? The job of being the only steward to the smallest chacks in the brood galaxy, she joked. And bodyguard, he corrected. But yes, it's a job. I even get a stipend from the Commonwealth every month. Oh, so that's how you can afford a place down the road. I thought the FC was subsidizing it. Sam made her way into the kitchen, leaving Bitey behind in the hallway. Bitey blinked a few times to process what the human had just said. Sam, I've been living here on Acadia for over a year. How did you not know this? I don't know. I guess it, it never came up. Wait, do I get a stipend from the Commonwealth too? Yes, you get a stipend. 
Despite still studying for a degree, you are a Commonwealth's ambassador adjacent to humanity and a provisional Jack's queen. Nice, she comments, coming out of the kitchen with a steaming mug of coffee. Anyway, I'm here to remind you that Opal is going to be meeting the human officials responsible for the Fold Gates project in Soda Territory in three hours. She wants you to join. Right, more meetings. Never ends, she muttered. That's the only reason you're here, Barty nods in response. That, and because it's my duty. You sure you weren't feeling lonely? Samantha smirked, taking a sip of coffee and watching him as he balked at the statement. Lonely, he said incredulously. Not since I've been around you insufferable humans. End of chapter. End of story. Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Duck Machine, Bezik, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Ashtraya the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below, both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.